Hello. Hello. Can you all hear me? No? Hello? Tess? Now. How about now? Can you all hear me? Yeah? Awesome. Okay. Okay. I got to bend down a little bit. But um, thank you guys for coming. Um, hi, friends. Nice to see y'all. Uh, I'm the president of Turning Point USA here. Uh, we have a club on campus. We're just a group of students who love freedom, love the free market of ideas. That's where we feel like college is. So we want to invite everybody, regardless of your beliefs, to hear out uh, what Christians believe, right? So this lecture is called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, and it's going to be given by Dr. Frank Turek. So please, uh, everybody welcome Dr. Frank Turek. Good evening, War Eagle. Well, speaking of war, let's go back to November, sorry, September 29th, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Monsoor is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Mansoor is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone... On the, on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, kill the Americans. As Monsoor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsoor in the chest and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Monsoor yells, grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsoor is dead. His two teammates lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsoor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsoor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsoor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the SEALs wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship, named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, Someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in today's culture, a lot of people don't think this story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. We know religious people tend to embellish things. And it's got miracles in it, like a resurrection. How many people in this room have ever seen someone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours? Yeah, none of us. Why? Because it doesn't happen. 
And if you're a Christian, you have to believe something none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you're going to realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah, that, that, that's actually from our TV show, which is on every Wednesday nights on DirecTV channel 378. If you don't have DirecTV, it's on Roku. And just look for NRB on Roku. That's the National Religious Broadcasters because it's streamed. If you don't have DirecTV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Alabama right now. It's called the Internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's on our website, crossexamine.org, at that time. We're also on radio every Saturday mornings. Now, I know if you're a college student, you don't get up until the crack of noon on Saturday, so you're not listening to it then, but that's okay. It's podcasted. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. And uh, we actually have two shows. One drops Friday afternoon, the other on uh, Tuesday. And uh, what we do is we present evidence for Christianity, and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, in the New Testament. This is going to serve as our outline here tonight. First question, does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying there's no truth. You know, you got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. Well, if there's no truth, Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, atheism can't be true either, right? Of course, there's truth, ladies and gentlemen. If there was no truth, would you be attending Auburn University? I mean, what are you here to learn, right? You're here to learn truth, not just opinions, and if there was no truth, could you ever catch someone in a lie? I mean, lies presuppose truth. So we're going to cover that question first. Second question, does God exist? Christianity can't be true if there's no God. I hope to show you tonight through three arguments that there really is a God. And these arguments are in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. In fact, people knew there was a God long before there was a Bible. You can just look around and figure out there's got to be a creator, a moral creator. So we're going to go through those three arguments. Third question, are miracles possible? Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. But I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible even atheists are admitting the evidence for. We'll see that tonight. Then we're going to try and get to the key question, is the New Testament true, particularly with regard to one event from the ancient world? Christianity stands or falls on this event. If the event occurred, it's true. If it didn't occur, it's false. What's the event? The resurrection, right? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity's true. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. In fact, Paul said, look, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, if you're a Christian, your faith is in vain. Now, there's a lot to cover here. We're going to spend most of our time on point two, but we'll cover the other points as well. Before I get into this, though, there's uh, four military or five military officers that I know of in the room right now. Three or four of them are in the Air Force, and one of them is in the Army. One of them's my son. They're right over here. Raise your hand, gentlemen. These gentlemen came from Maxwell. My son is a major in the Air Force. Most of these guys are majors, so give them a hand for serving the country if you would, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so we're going to start right here at point one. Does truth exist? And whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. Right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, Tigers, that was lame. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle That's not how he said it. Here's how he said it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try that again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. That felt better, didn't it? Didn't you always want to say that at, here at Auburn? You 
can't handle the truth. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, if you don't get anything else out of what we talk about here tonight, even if you're an atheist, I think this is a very valuable thinking skill. In fact, it's the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. And to show you what a dimwit I was, I was 33 years old, I already had a master's degree, and I did not know what I'm about to tell you now. You know why I never knew it? Because I never had a course in logic. How many people have had a real course in logic? Can I see your hands, please? All right, see these people with their hands up? These are the homeschoolers, right here, you see that? We don't teach logic in public school. If we did, things would be a lot better. Instead of teaching kids how to think, we're teaching them what to feel. What we're gonna talk about here is one of the fundamental laws of all logic. It's called the law of non-contradiction. It says opposite ideas cannot be both true at the same time and in the same sense. We can't both be at Auburn and not at Auburn at the same time and in the same sense, right? We're either here or we're not. God can't both exist and not exist at the same time and in the same sense. It's one or the other. And this law of non-contradiction is going to save you from a lot of pain and suffering if you apply it properly. Why? Because what we're about to do is analyze many claims that the culture makes that logically are false because they violate the law of non-contradiction. The problem is a lot of people believe these claims and they start living their lives according to them and then ultimately they smack up against reality and it hurts. You can save yourself a lot of pain and suffering by applying the law of non-contradiction. So let's apply it. And I'm going to show you this thinking skill. It's very easy. Suppose someone were to come up to you and say, there is no truth. This is the relativistic postmodernist claim. Someone says, there is no truth. You should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. Can everybody see this is a self-defeating statement? It would be like me saying, I can't speak a word in English. What would you say if I said that? Hey, man, you're using English to say it. Or it'd be like me saying, my parents had no kids that lived. Or my brother is an only child, right? These are self-defeating statements, and you got to get good at recognizing them. And here's the way you get good at recognizing them or exposing them. You turn the claim on itself turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself and you ask, is that? Now, you can amaze your friends with this. You don't have to be unkind doing this. You're just asking questions, right? So suppose a friend of yours says, all truth is relative. If you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask back? Yeah, is that a relative truth? No. Can everyone see this is an absolute truth claim, claiming all truths are relative? It's like saying, I can't speak a word in English. Or how about this one? In fact, in our culture, it's more often said this way, or at least intimated this way. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You know, I've got my truth, you've got your truth, you live your truth, I live my truth, we'll all get along. It sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds like we all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah, doesn't it? There's just one big problem with it. It violates the law of non-contradiction. Because if somebody says there isn't the truth, only my truth, you ought to turn the claim on itself and ask them, is that just your truth or the truth? In other words, is this statement up here just your truth? It's just your opinion. If it is, why should I believe it? But if you're saying this statement up here is the truth, can't you see the first half of the statement says there aren't any the truths? That this is a the truth claim, claiming there are no the truth claims? It's self-defeating. I know this is very unpopular to say in our culture right now, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. If you want to say you have your own truth, you might as well say, I have my own math. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, imagine if uh, Jaden, who started this thing off, said, hey, Frank, can you hang another day uh, around here at Auburn because we got some stuff to do around campus. In fact, if you stay another day, I'll pay you $10 an hour. You just tell me how many hours you work and I'll pay you. Now, actually, Jaden would never do this. He doesn't pay that much. All right, but let's suppose I did. Suppose, imagine, imagine I stayed tomorrow and I worked the whole day, 15 hours. He goes, what do I owe you? I said, okay, I worked 15 hours times $10 an hour. You owe me $150,000. He's going to go, $150,000? I don't owe you $150,000. I owe you 150, and I go, oh no, you don't understand. I have my own math. 
He's going to say, you're crazy, man. There's not my math or your math. There's just math. Now, I know there's a few parents in here, and you're saying, my kid bring home, brings home math, and it ain't my math. I'm not talking about that, all right? But look, math like truth is, is objective. It's absolute. And if we're going to say we have our own truth, you might as well say you have your own math, and you know that just doesn't work. Or how about this? You hear this a lot. It's true for you, but not for me. Well, Christianity may be true for you, but Buddhism's true for me. What do you say to that? Close. There you go. Someone says it's true for you, but not for me. Say, hey, is that true for everybody? Is true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me is true for everybody, then true for you, but not for me can't be true because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough, but that's because it's self-defeating. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, say, sure, go try that the next time you get pulled over. <laughs> Let's say you're going down Highway 85, 100 miles an hour. Alabama State Trooper sees you, pulls you over, knocks on your glass, you put the window down. He says, you were going 100. It's easy to get out of a ticket. You simply say, ha. That's true for you, but not for me. And you speed away. He can't give you a ticket if it's not true for you. No, if it's true you were going 100, that's true for all people at all times, in all places, when referring to you at that time. Same thing is true. If God exists, it's true for everybody at all times, whether you believe it or not. Of course, if he doesn't exist, even if you believe it, it's false. How about this? You hear this in the engineering department. There's no truth in anything but science. What's the problem with this claim? Turn the claim on itself. Yeah, you simply ask them, is that a scientific truth? Can you go in the laboratory and prove that claim? No, that's not a scientific claim. That's not a statement of science. That's a statement about science. And you can't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. In fact, when you get a PhD here from the Auburn University, what does a PhD stand for? Not phenomenally dumb, nice try. It stands philosophy of the doctorate in whatever, physics, biology, history. Philosophy undergirds everything. You can't, you can't read the Bible without philosophy, which is right thinking about reality. You're bringing certain principles to the text to understand what's going on. In fact, we have a section of the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, about science, and here's the title of it. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Why do I say that? Because all data needs to be gathered and all data needs to be interpreted. And who does that? Scientists do that. You ever wonder why you've gotten conflicting advice on COVID? You say, follow the science. You go, which science? Look, if scientists have good data and they interpret it properly, you get good advice. If they got good data, don't interpret it properly, you're going to get bad advice. If they got bad data, it doesn't matter how they interpret it, you're going to get bad advice. If there's a political agenda, oh, that'll never happen. Do you know the United States government, there's a lawsuit about this right now, was trying to censor Stanford epidemiologists through big tech. Science got real political, didn't it? People made a lot of money on a vaccine that we now know has a lot of problems. People also had a lot of power. You know, they were, they were closing churches, but strip clubs, abortion clinics, and liquor stores were open. I guess we know it's essential in this country, don't we? Yeah, politics can get, or science can get politicized. That's why you've got to see who's doing it and try and figure out what's the proper interpretation of the data. How about this? This is probably the biggest one in our culture. You ought not judge. In fact, if you're a Christian, they'll say, Jesus said don't judge. Why are you judging, you hypocrites? All right, let's, yeah, let, that's right. Let's leave Jesus aside for just a second. What's the logical problem with the claim? Yeah, if somebody says you ought not judge, you might want to ask them, isn't that a judgment? Or if they say don't judge, you might want to say, then why are you judging me for judging? You say, well, but didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is the middle of his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. All right, I know this is going to sound odd for just a minute, but stick with me. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. You think when Matthew was writing his biography of Jesus that we call a gospel, he said, here's chapter 7, verse 1. No. When were the chapter and verse divisions put in? 
Yeah, about 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is important, right? Imagine if you didn't have uh, any numbers in your Bible and the pastor didn't have any numbers in his and you went to church one Sunday and he had this big book and he just opened it up and he said, let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot, right? You couldn't do that, right? You need numbers in there to help you find things. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. You can't do that. Now, some of you are going to hate me for this, but I don't care. I'm leaving tonight. So won't be back probably after this. This is why you should never say Jeremiah 29.11 is a promise to you if you're a Christian. Oh, you know Jeremiah 29.11. Oh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in the future. This is on birthday cards. This is on pillows. This is on coffee mugs. This is on posters. It's everywhere. And it's not a promise to 21st century Christians. Who's that a promise to? Who's that written to? Yes, it's written to the exiles who were taken forcibly out of Judah in 586 B.C. and taken to modern-day Iraq or Babylon by the dictator Nebuchadnezzar. And God, through Jeremiah, was promising them that 70 years later he was going to prosper them and bring them back to the land. It's not a promise to us. Yet I hear people, I'm going to claim Jeremiah 29.11. I, I, when they do that, I say, why don't you claim Jeremiah 44.11? What's Jeremiah 44.11? Jeremiah 44, 11, it was what God promised to do to the exiles that went to Egypt. And he warned them, don't go to Egypt. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? It says, I will destroy you and all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow. You don't see that on a coffee mug. You don't see that on a birthday card. Happy birthday. I will destroy you and all Judah. That is so sweet, Grandma. Thank you so much. No. We're taking stuff out of context. And the same thing is true when we take Matthew 7, 1 out of context. Does Jesus just say, judge not, and he stops right there? No, what does he say? Judge not, lest you be judged. By the same standard you judge others, you be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, notice that's a judgment. Take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. And then he starts talking about don't cast your pearls before swine, which requires another series of judgments. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. Don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. It would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made 100 judgments just getting over here tonight. And now you're going, this was a bad judgment. This guy's crazy. Why am I here? No. Everybody's making judgments. Atheists are making judgments. What judgments do they make? There's no God. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. There is no objective meaning to life. When you die, you just become worm food. It's hopeless. Have a nice day. Right? These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? I will say this, Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? What was their job? What did they do? Yeah, they were the religious and political leaders. They were on the Sanhedrin, to whom Rome delegated much of the day-to-day -day legal making authority. In other words, they were the politicians in Israel. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip, and he goes, and he jacks people up in the temple. Sweet and gentle Jesus said this. Yes. And then in John chapter 8, he's arguing with these same political Pharisees, these religious politicians. He's right in the middle of the argument with them when he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. Can you imagine you're having an argument with somebody and you stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. And then in Matthew 23, Jesus really goes after these Pharisees. What does he say? 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside, you're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle, Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! In fact, I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. How often have you heard those passages spoken about? Do you know Jesus did not come to bring unity? He came to bring a sword that's going to divide you, if you're a Christian, from the world. He wants unity in the church. And some of you know, because you're Christians in here, that those verses are true. Why? Because some of you are divided in your own family over Jesus. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. You ever notice when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? You know, if you say to your best friend, I really love you, you're such a wonderful person, I wish I could be like you, you th think your friend's going to say, well, who are you to judge? No, they're never going to say that. See, I've noticed that people don't have a problem with judging, they just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get upset with you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. A few military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. Men love darkness rather than light, said Jesus. So we have to tell the truth, and we have to make judgments, but we have to do it without being judgmental. In fact, Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. You know, you've got to make a judgment whether to be a Christian or not. You've got to make judgments every day. But we can't be judgmental. For you Christians in here, by the way, none of us are going to make it to God because we're better than anyone else. The only way we make it is on what he did, not what we do. We just trust in him. Now, there's so many more of these self-defeating statements, we don't have time to get into them, but I want to sum up this whole section this way. Can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? Which means relativism and postmodernism are false because they claim it's true that there is no truth. Now, tragically, many of our high schools and most of our universities, maybe here with the exception of Auburn, has, have bought into postmodernism. That's why you're seeing crazy ideas on campus right now. But it's false. I mean, why would you pay $30,000 a year to have some professor tell you the truth that there is no truth? That's madness. Of course there's truth, and you can know it. The problem is sometimes we don't like it. We do a lot of these campus events. This is our third this week. This is actually a picture from several years ago from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California at Berserkley does. And uh, we have a microphone set up, and we'll set up this microphone later. And if you're not a Christian here, thank you for being here. But if you're not a Christian and you ask a question, I may ask you a question. And it's not fair of me to do that unless I tell you the question in advance. So I'm going to tell you right now. Here's the question I might ask you. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no. No? Wait, I thought you claimed to be reasonable. I thought you claimed to be rational. How is it reasonable and rational you wouldn't believe something that were true? Well, it's not about reason. It's not about the head. It's about the heart. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God of their own lives. And half the time, I want to be too, don't you? It's inconvenient. We're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. And we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. Here's the problem. You can't make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of fun but selfish and sinful things. However, however over the long term, it's a disaster. 
And everyone in this room over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves. If you want to get true contentment, you got to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. So always ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If the person hesitates or says no, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. We can talk about what do you do with someone like that later and during the Q&A if you want. But always ask the question. Or if you want to take Christianity out of, it, out of it, you can say, if Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God, would you follow him? Let's see what they say. All right, so truth does exist. The next question, is it true that God exists? And I mentioned there are three arguments we're going to look at. And we're going to spend a lot of time on these arguments because they're critical to the whole case. Three arguments for the existence of God. There's more than this, but these are the three we're going to talk about. The first is the argument from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological just comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. And it says if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, life, then there's got to be a designer. These two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. The third argument isn't science. It's more philosophical. Yet it's the argument you've all intuitively understood since you were a very small child. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one. Like it's wrong to torture babies for fun. Or it's wrong to torture babies rape women, desecrate their bodies, and then burn them, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no God, that's just your opinion against the terrorist's opinion. Now, we know this just isn't a matter of opinion, that torturing, raping, burning civilians is really wrong. If it's really wrong, there must be a standard of really right that we're obligated to obey. That standard can only exist if God exists. Otherwise, everything's just a matter of opinion. We'll get to that argument later, but we gotta start with the cosmological argument. You gotta admit, it was worth coming out here tonight just to see God do that. Did you guys see that? Some of you said, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. <laughs> now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big. Now, I know there's some Christians in here going, uh, Frank, you know, we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists are admitting it. Stephen Hawking, who was probably the top physicist in the world until he died about six years ago. Some of you may know Hawking was a medical miracle. He had ALS like for 45 years or so. Normally it kills you in a couple years. He lived with it for decades. But he was an atheist. Nevertheless, he said this. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God for this. He failed, but he's admitting the data. That space, time, and matter literally had a beginning out of nothing. Now, there's a lot of evidence for this, but we're not going to cover it tonight. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. And number three, it's not controversial. Even atheists are admitting it. You know what is controversial? Not that the universe had a beginning. But what caused the universe to have a beginning? That's what we're going to talk about in just a minute. But before we get there, I do want to give you one piece of philosophical evidence, which I think shows indisputably that the universe had a beginning. It's going to take you to think for just a second. Let's take a look at this timeline. Here's today, there's yesterday, there's the day before yesterday, there's last week. Let's say we don't know how far this timeline goes. My only question is this. Can this timeline be infinite into the past? No, why not? Not everything starts somewhere because God didn't start somewhere. Can't add to an infinite. That's part of it. What's that? This is the interactive portion of the program. 
Yeah, you would never get to today if there were an infinite number of days before today. Why? Because if there's an infinite number of days before today, before you got to this day, you'd have to live an infinite number of days. You'd always have to live another day, another day, another day. But since today is here, there can only be a finite number of days before today. I do realize this can give you intellectual constipation. But just think about this. This is called the Kalam cosmological argument. If the past were infinite, today never would have arrived, which means time had a beginning. If time had a beginning, what could have caused time? Only something outside of time. That something outside of time must be eternal because that something outside of time didn't have a beginning itself. Whatever that thing is, that's the uncaused first cause. This answers the question, if this is God, who made God? No one made God. That's the whole point. He's the uncaused first cause. He's outside of time. He didn't have a beginning. Now, let's just jump to the bottom line of this argument. If the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. The evidence leaves us with one of the following two options. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable, that no one created something out of nothing or that someone created something out of nothing? What do you think? Number two, right? There are atheists out there, however, that say that number one is more reasonable, like Lawrence Krauss, who for a while taught at Arizona State University, wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing. He failed to explain how the universe could come out of existence out of nothing, but he tried. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that everyone believes in at least one miracle? I mean, Christians believe in this miracle and many others, but atheists believe in one miracle. They believe that no one created something out of nothing. Now, which view takes more faith, do you think? Yeah, number one takes more faith. Now think about it this way, ladies and gentlemen. If space, time, and matter had a beginning, as science shows and philosophy shows, then whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must transcend space, time, and matter. The cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal in order to choose to create. You go, why personal? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. The being would also have to be intelligent, to have a mind to make a choice. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, how do you know it's the Christian God, Frank? We don't. Yet. I mean, this could be Allah at this point or some other theistic or deistic God. But if we keep going through the evidence and we realize that Jesus rose from the dead, then we can say that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. In other words, this could be the God of the Bible, but we don't know if it is yet. But we've got six attributes that line up with the God of the Bible. By the way, Leibniz, a famous philosopher a couple hundred years ago, asked this question. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? I mean, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Why does the universe exist? Why do you exist? Why does the sun exist? Why does, why does anything exist if there's no God? There's got to be an uncaused first cause. You can't go on an infinite regress of causes. So that's the cosmological. There's a lot more in the books. We're going to spend more time on this argument. The design argument, and there are two aspects to this argument. The universe appears to be designed, and you appear to be designed. Let's start with the universe first. In recent decades, scientists have discovered the universe is fine-tuned to support life on Earth. If you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, either the universe wouldn't exist, or if it did, it couldn't support life. And even Stephen Hawking... The atheist admitted this. Here's what he said. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. In other words, if the expansion rate at the very beginning was that infinitesimally different, none of us would be here. You can't make any sort of evolutionary explanation for this. You can't say, well, maybe it evolved to this point by chance. Why? Because... This is the initial condition of the universe. It didn't change at all. It started right in the proper, at the proper rate 
a little bit faster or slower, we wouldn't be here. Seems to me the same being that created space, matter, and time is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't exist. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I, so let me give you an illustration. Take the entire North American continent from Central America to Greenland and stack it in dimes all the way to the moon. That's 238,000 miles. And then do that on a billion other North American continents. And then take all those dimes, put them in one huge pile, mark one dime red, mix it in, blindfold a friend, throw them on the pile, ask him to pick one dime at random. The chance he would pick that one red dime is one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Is he going to pick that dime? No. No. This kind of fine tuning is just almost incomprehensible. And this is just one of about a dozen of these. Change any one of them, we're not here. And if you throw in the universe, I'm sorry, the solar system, the solar system has about a hundred of these features that if you were to change any one of them, we wouldn't be here. In fact, let's take a look at our solar system here for just a second. Where are we? Right here, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to, or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it is? That's a lie, it's way too hot here in the summer. The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees, change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours, change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us, change that slightly, we don't exist. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth, why not? What does Jupiter do for us? Its gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, take a close up look at Jupiter here. You know what these dark marks are? Those are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Saturn does the same thing for us, by the way. In fact, let's take a look at the planets in terms of size. Here you got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. Do you know Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet? I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> and what if Pluto identifies as a planet? What then, you bigots? Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus, that's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on uh, Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus now? You see it way over here? That's Antares, another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here would be, look, I don't name the stars, okay? If the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. And that's just in our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles, and all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius to go 30 trillion miles. Now, you remember when we had a space shuttle it used to go around the Earth? The space shuttle, when it orbited the Earth, was going about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? Take the space shuttle.
right? You'll be five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star inside our galaxy, an average distance away, 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long do you think it would take us? A long time. You must be a math major. It would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away in our galaxy, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. It took us nine years to get to Pluto. In fact, if our solar system was the size of a quarter with the sun at the center and Pluto at the outer rim, you know where the next nearest star is? It's over two football fields away. We're never going to get there. We're never going to get to another planetary system. It's too far and it's too dangerous. By the way, at light speed, 186,000 miles per second, you know how long it would take us to get to the next nearest star? Almost four years. Imagine if we figure that out. Actually, what I'm about to show you now is a little bit disturbing, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. You're a mature audience. Imagine we get to another planetary system. We plant our flag, and then this happens. Beans are not for astronauts, tigers. Now to show you how, uh, how analytical my wife is, who is, she's here tonight, by the way, but I'm not going to point her out because she'll kill me. Um, but to show you how analytical my wife is, I showed her that little video, and she smiled just a little bit, and then she said, that's illogical. There's no sound in space. <laughs> now notice what the psalmist says about God's love regarding the heavens. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope has helped us discover that. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, this is hard to see. But along the bottom of this slide, these are mountains down here. This is the southern hemisphere. In 2003, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 26 millionth of the sky for 11 days of exposure time. What's one twenty-six millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about one twenty-six millionth of the sky. So they did this, and I'm going to show you what they discovered. Okay, there's no audio. It's just video. When I play it, you're going to see the constellations come up, and then Hubble's going to show us what's in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. You guys ready? You guys ready? Man, you guys are like asleep tonight. Come on. Here it is. Here are the constellations. By the way, this is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You can Google this. What you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. Each of these galaxies have billions of stars of their own. And how many stars are there in the entire universe? I mean, if you find billions of stars in one twenty-six millionth of the sky... How many stars are there in the entire universe? The number of stars in the entire universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth 
times 100,000. And to go from just one star to another star inside our galaxy, going five miles a second will take you over 200,000 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I never want to hear a war eagle again use the word awesome for anything other than the heavens or God. Awesome shot, dude. Awesome shirt, dude. Awesome TikTok video. No! What are you going to save awesome for if everything's awesome? Now, if this is meant to communicate in a physical reality what the immaterial nature of God is, and it is, the heavens declare the glory of God, we're all in big trouble. Why? Because this means he's infinitely just. And if he's infinitely just, he has to punish unjust creatures. And that's all of us. So what's the solution? I only showed you the first half of the verse a second ago. Here's the second half. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Yes, he's infinitely just, but he's also infinitely loving. How does he remove our transgressions from us? The only way he can remain just and not punish us is if he punishes an innocent substitute who volunteers to take our punishment on himself. Where is he going to find an innocent substitute? Not in any one of us. What does he need to do? He needs to add humanity to his deity, come to earth, allow the very creatures that rebelled against him and sinned against him and others to take their punishment on himself. So by trusting in him, we could not only be forgiven, but given his righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary claim. He's not just saying, I just said so because I'm God. There's no other way an infinitely just being can allow unjust creatures like us to go unpunished unless he punishes an innocent substitute in our place. This is why Paul says in his his letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 26, God remains just and is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's not an arbitrary claim. Now, when you look at a universe that has stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 Earths, that'll take you over 200,000 years at five miles a second to go between, does that make you feel insignificant? It shouldn't. Why? Because as amazing as the heavens are, They're not as amazing as you are because you're made in the image of God. In fact, the heavens were created for you. And here's the second part of the design argument. Your design. In fact, this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? Human. In fact, let's go back further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States, 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race, and you won. (laughs) Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool, but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter genome, your software program, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now your genetic information has just duplicated itself in fact there were only four things separating you from adulthood time air water and food 
Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. All right, people are going to say, but Frank, you know, you can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this, friends. This was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, well, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? And by the way, you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots. Why do you get to impose ought nots, but I don't? Actually, the better answer is this. If anyone ever says to you, don't impose your morality on me, I think what you ought to say is, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that abortion's wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that you ought not mutilate children. I didn't make up the fact that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law, have the law written on their hearts. Look, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose, whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, inside of you, an astonishing complexity of growth began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second, for most anyway. Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made four million new red blood cells. You just made another four million new red blood cells. You just made another, four, knock it off. Are you thinking about this? Are you going, wait a minute, Frank, I gotta concentrate. New red blood cells coming up. No, this is just happening. How's it happening? Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. Of course, he didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature's going in a direction. In fact, he said, you ever notice that an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always goes in the direction of an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree, or a birch tree, or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, oh, gee, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. But if it reliably goes in a direction and it doesn't have a mind of its own, there's got to be an external mind directing it toward an end. This is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that all of nature is going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, some mind is directing it. Now, I get endlessly frustrated with atheists who mischaracterize this argument. They don't understand that Aristotle and Aquinas are not talking about the Big Bang cause way back when. In fact, Aristotle mistakenly thought the universe was eternal. What Aristotle and Aquinas are saying, even if it is eternal, you need a mind right now to keep everything going. It's a right now cause. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen to the music the second the band stopped playing? Music's over. Same thing is true with God. He creates the universe, the natural laws that govern it, and he creates you, and he sustains the universe, the natural laws that govern it, and he sustains you. If he were to pull his hand, his hand, hand away, the universe would go out of existence. It's a right now cause. This is why the Apostle Paul came along and said, in him we live and move and have our being, and Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. 
So it's not just a cause way back when. They're talking about a cause right now. He's present. You ever wonder why we can do science? Why can we do science? Because the universe is orderly and it's consistent and persistent. This is why you can find reliable cause and effect in the universe. Because it's directed. It's not random. There's a lot more in the book Stealing from God. We don't have it here, but it's a book I wrote on this issue and many others. So if you want to go further, you can. But we've got to move on to our final argument, the moral argument. And in order to deal with this argument, we need to start with football. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? That's when he throws it to the other team and they take it back for a touchdown. How do you know? This is the interactive portion of the program. How do you know? What's that? They're jersey, but yet, but you don't, that's not enough. You need to know more than that. Close. What? Not just the rules. What's above the rules? You got to know the purpose of the game. If you know the purpose of the game, then you can say, oh, the touchdown gets us closer to the purpose while the pick six takes us further away. If you didn't know the purpose, you couldn't make judgments as to whether or not this was a good play and this was a bad play. Now, notice in football, the purpose comes, uh, the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When you guys, who are you playing this week? Mississippi State, right here? Okay. When, when the Tigers show up and uh, play Mississippi State on Saturday, the rules are already set, the purpose is already set, the players just show up and they play, right? The purpose and the rules come from outside the game. They come from the NC2A. And every year or so, they may tweak the rules a little bit. Why? Because the rules are arbitrary. In football, they could be different, right? In fact, when they first started football, you couldn't pass the ball. Everything had to be run, right? So they, they changed the rules, okay? Now, it's true in life that the rules do come from outside the game, and so does the purpose, but they're not arbitrary because they come from the creator. And if there is no creator, if there is no God, you can't say this is the right way to live and this is the wrong way to live because if there is no God, there is no purpose. Just like you can't say a touchdown's better than a pick six. So I know this is going to sound a little bit shocking, but if there is no God, the Nazis were not wrong. Neither was Hamas. It's just your opinion. If there is no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you might like love better, but that's just a preference. If there is no God, there are no human rights. Have you noticed in the United States of America, we seem to be creating rights every 10 minutes? And many of these people are claiming they have rights and they're atheists. You know, if there's no God, there's no right. There's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural marriage. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life. There's no such thing as trans rights because there's no such thing as human rights. There aren't any rights unless God exists. And then when you go look at who God is, then you realize what really is a right and what really isn't. If there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism aren't wrong, but we know they're wrong. If there is no God, religious people have never done anything wrong. If you're a Christian in here, what is the objection you hear from non-Christians all the time about you? You're a hypocrite. When someone says that to you, if you're a Christian, you know what you ought to say? I am. What's your point? Also, you've just given evidence for God. Why? What's wrong with hypocrisy if there's no God? Nothing. You're complaining that I'm not living up to my own standards. I might also say you're not living up to your standards either, do you? In fact, none of us do, no matter what our standards are. We're all hypocrites. Now, you might know somebody, or maybe it's you yourself that's not a Christian because Christians have wronged you. I'm sorry for that. Christians often do evil things, and so do atheists. And because they do good or bad things doesn't tell you necessarily whether their view is true or not. But Dr. John Dixon from Down Under asks you this question. If you've been wronged by a Christian, here's the question he asks you to consider. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven, right? 
So when somebody plays Jesus poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Newsflash, Christianity is, is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the standard. And we don't live up to his standard. But if we did, we wouldn't need him. I don't think I've mentioned this here tonight yet. I, I've done a lot of these lately, but let me. Have I mentioned to you that you can get to heaven by being good? Have I mentioned this? You can. Yeah, you just got to be perfect your whole life. Too late for me. How about you? No, we need a Savior. In fact, um, how many know uh, Christopher Hitchens? Know of him? You remember Christopher Hitchens? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. And uh, this is a picture from our second debate. You can see these debates on our YouTube channel, the cross Examine YouTube channel. He wrote this book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And during the debate, I kept asking Christopher, you're claiming that religion is evil, basically, by saying it poisons everything. What's your standard of good by which you'd even know what evil was? And he couldn't answer the question. But he was really good rhetorically. He made some fun quips. And I pointed out, yeah, Christopher, a lot of what you say in your book is true. Religious people have done evil things, but you're sort of proving our worldview. We agree we've done evil things. That's why we need a savior. In fact, when people say, and I said this at the debate, I said, when people, when people tell me I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. Of course we're hypocrites. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. I mean, that would be like saying I can't go to the gym because there's too many out of shape people down there, right? Well, that's why they're there. They're trying to get in shape. And by the way, religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I, I poison religion because I don't live up to the pure words of Christ. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. I need a savior. We all need a savior. And that's why Christianity is unique. It's not only true, it's the only world religion where you don't achieve your identity, you receive your identity. God does all the work for you. And if there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. By the way, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? Be careful how you answer Christians. No, Christians are not commanded to be tolerant. tolerant tolerance is too weak. Christians are commanded to love. You see, tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. And how do you help people? Do you approve of everything they do? Unfortunately, our culture thinks that love means approval. Love does not mean approval. Every parent knows this. How many parents do we have in here? Okay, how many former children do we have in here? Okay, good. That's all of us, right? Question. If your parents approved of everything you wanted to do when you were 13, would they have been loving parents? No, parents need to stand in the way of evil. They just can't approve of everything the kid wants to do. They would be enabling the child to do evil rather than protecting the child. So love doesn't mean approval. In fact, in the passage that everybody reads at their wedding but nobody obeys, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love rejoices in the truth. Love always protects. Love always perseveres. If you want to help somebody, you need to tell them the truth, not affirm everything they do. And Thomas Sowell, who says everything well, put it this way. When you, if you, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. And too often we tell people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. You know why we tell them what they want to hear? So they don't get mad at us. That's not loving them. That's enabling them. Finally, you can't complain about the problem of evil if there is no God. Why can't you complain about the problem of evil? Because evil doesn't exist unless there is a God. You say, why? Is God doing evil? No. Evil only exists if good exists, and good only exists if God exists. And C.S. Lewis found this out. In fact, early on in his life, C.S. Lewis was an atheist because he went through World War I. His best friend died in World War I. In fact, Lewis made a pledge with his friend that they both made a pledge. If either of them died, they would go home and take care of their parents. Lewis took care of this guy's mother till she died. But early on, he said there couldn't be a good God because there's too much injustice in the world. And then he ultimately wrote 
in mere Christianity the solution to what he originally thought. He said this, As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what injustice was unless you knew what justice was. You wouldn't know something's not right unless you knew what was right. In other words, there's got to be a standard out there. You say, well, why can't evil exist on its own? Because it's a lack in a good thing. It's a privation in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You got nothing. Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto, right? No, you got nothing. It doesn't exist. Or you can put it this way, the shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you've got to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have good without evil. You can have sunshine without shadows, but you can't have evil without good. You can't have shadows without sunshine. So if evil exists, God exists. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but evil does not disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there. But it doesn't disprove God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. You guys with me on this? Okay. Now you can ask the question, you know, why does God allow certain evils? That's another question. We'll deal with it during the Q&A if you want to go there. But the bottom line is evil actually shows God does exist. Now, what can we conclude from these three arguments? From the cosmological argument, we can see we've got a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause. From the design argument, we can see that this being, we get more information that this being's intelligent. We also see that this being is sustaining the universe. And then from the moral argument, we see that this being is also morally perfect. So ladies and gentlemen, from these three arguments, we get a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent, moral creator who created all things and sustains all things. This is the God of biblical Christianity, and we haven't opened the Bible yet. This is called natural theology. In fact, when somebody asks you, how do you know that God exists? Here is what I think you ought to say. I know God by his effects. If there's a creation, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a creator. If there's design, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on my heart, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a moral lawgiver. If I have the ability to know things outside my skull, I have these laws of logic, this ability to reason, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a mind. If there's a a man out there who predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead. That's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause. Who could rise, predict the future and rise someone from the dead? Only somebody like God. So you're always reasoning from effect to cause. Even if you think you have a personal experience with God, you're doing the same thing. You're saying the effect is the experience and you're reasoning back to a cause that God caused this experience. You're always reasoning from effect back to cause. By the way, this is what science is built on. You always start with effects and you try and figure out what caused the effect. It's a very, if I, <laughs> the queen of all sciences is what? Does anyone know, traditionally? Theology. Because it puts every area of, of academic inquiry under one big umbrella. How do we understand God's truth? So, the only question we have now, how do we know who is the true God? This could be Allah or some other theistic God. For that, we've got to go to point three, our miracles possible. You're probably looking at your watch. How is he going to get through this? Look, number three is the shortest. It doesn't take very long. The problem is a lot of people think miracles are impossible, like Noah. Hey, Christians. Can we just admit something in this room? We'll just keep this between us tonight that Noah and the ark is crazy. It is. A resurrection. I already asked you guys how many people in here have ever seen someone rise from the dead. Nobody raised their hand. Yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe something that none of us have ever seen. 
And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? What is the deal with Jonah? Can you actually believe in Jonah? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? It's not the resurrection. Yeah, the greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible. I mean, if it's true that God created space, time, and matter, can he do whatever he wants that's not logically impossible inside of space, time, and matter? Of course. Here's the interesting thing. Atheists are admitting the evidence for the first verse. They don't think it's God, but as we pointed out, what else could this cause be? It flows straight from the data that if space, time, and matter had a beginning, you've got to have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause. So if God can create the universe out of nothing, can he raise Jesus from the dead? Of course Noah's crazy, unless God exists. Of course Noah's a fairy, or Jonah's a fairy tale, unless God exists. God can do all these things. In other words, if Genesis 1-1 is true, Every other verse is at least possible. You just can't rule it out. Now the problem is a lot of people rule out miracles because they've never seen one. That's not a good reason necessarily to disbelieve something because you haven't seen one. You believe in a lot of things you've never seen. Like your mind. Have you ever seen your mind? You're using it right now. Like the laws of logic and the laws of math. Have you ever seen those? No, you're using them right now. You believe in justice. Have you ever seen justice? Oh, you may have seen people treated justly or unjustly, but you've never seen it directly. Why? Because it's not something you see directly. It's an immaterial virtue grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen love, and everyone believes in love. In fact, in the uh, second debate with Christopher Hitchens, some kid at the College of New Jersey during the Q&A asked Christopher this question. He said, Christopher, what is love? And Christopher, being a materialist, meaning he only thinks that molecules exist, he, th he thinks everybody's a moist robot, right? He had to come up with a materialistic answer to love. And so after he hemmed and hawed for a little while, he finally said, love is a chemical. And I said to him, don't tell that to your wife. Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? Because I got the chemical today. You know, tomorrow I might not have it. No, love is not a chemical. Love is a choice that you make to treat somebody in a way that seeks what's best for them. But it's not something you see directly. By the way, you've never seen gravity. Oh, sure, Frank, we've seen it. There it is right there. No, you're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. We really don't even know what gravity is. Did you know that? You've never seen George Washington. Yet you believe he existed. Why? Because he's left effects, uh, effects behind that are best explained by a man who lived from 1732 to 1799. Most of you have never seen Bo Jackson either. But he's left effects behind, and you know he existed, and still does, by the way, but even though you've never seen him. Same thing is true with Jesus. You may have never seen him physically, but he's left effects behind that help you understand that he exists. Now, do you realize that miracles don't have to have occurred since the first century for Christianity could, to be true? There could be no miracles since the first century and Christianity would still be true. I think there have been miracles since then. In fact, Craig Keener, who's a brilliant researcher at Asbury Seminary, a, couple, uh, a decade or so ago, wrote a hernia-inducing two-volume set on modern-day miracles, where he documents all these. But even if Keener's wrong, Christianity could still be true, even if miracles haven't occurred since the first century. And if miracles do occur, even now, you ought not expect to see a lot of them. Why? Because miracles, by definition, have to be rare to get our attention. If they're happening all the time, we don't consider them miracles. We say, hey, this stuff happens all the time, right? I mean, imagine if resurrections occurred routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Nothing. You go to somebody and go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. No, it's got to be a rare event. It can't be a regular event. In fact, there are things that happen every single day that are so spectacular 
And many people don't even think it points back to God because they happen all the time. And they're spectacular. I mean, how many people in here, every mother should raise your hand, only the guys I'm really asking now, how many people in here have seen your own flesh and blood born? Now, when you see your own flesh and blood coming out of yourself or another human being, you don't go, evolution, right? You go, this is amazing. We made Whoopi nine months ago, and now look at this. How does this happen? There's design behind it. It happens every day, and people are kind of blasé about it. Oh, yeah, it just happens every day. Miracles, if they're going to get our attention, have to be rare. All right, so miracles are used to show that someone speaks for God. That's, that, that's why if you look in the Bible, you'll see miracles bunched in three areas. Moses, Elijah and Elijah, and Jesus and the apostles. Why? Because these people have new revelation that needs new confirmation. Why should people listen to Moses, Elijah, or Jesus? Because they can do miracles. It's authenticating them as speaking for God. So we know that miracles are possible, certainly if God exists. The only question we have to answer now is, has the second greatest miracle in the Bible actually occurred, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. Because if God exists and Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. So what evidence do we have that Jesus rose from the dead? In the book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. We have some of them out there. We have a chapter called The Top Ten Reasons We Know the New Testament Writers Told the Truth. We don't have time for ten. We're just going to look at two. The first one we're going to look at is called Embarrassing uh, stories. Embarrassing stories. This is what historians do when they look at ancient texts or even current day texts. If there's something embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why would it be true? Because you're not going to make up embarrassing stories about yourself. You might make yourself look good, but you won't make yourself look bad. In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? No, you don't do that. You don't lie to embarrass yourself. You might lie to make yourself look good. Well, the New Testament writers, this is true of the Old Testament as well, but we're just looking at the New Testament. The New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories they never would have invented. That's why we call this the dove factor. They're not making this up. In fact, let me just give you a few of them. Peter, their leader, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they made this up? Do you think Mark, who wrote this down, at one point said to Peter, hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. This doesn't look good. And then Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away. They all run away. And who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote the New Testament documents down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews Why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? I mean, if I was there and inventing it, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd write something down like this. Let's see, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. That sounds pretty good. John said, get out. Peter roundhouse kicked him. Thomas said, we'll be back. No doubt. Some of you will get that tomorrow. And then on Sunday morning, we marched right down to the tomb, and we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say it was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down to discover the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Forget about the fact it was embarrassing to men. It was. But independent of that, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses? Yeah, because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. And certainly not a formerly demon-possessed woman, Mary Magdalene. That was one of their star witnesses. Gee, what a, what a great witness you got there. 
No, a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were. I actually had a woman come up to me once, and she said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. I said, that is an excellent point. I hadn't thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> the nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next passage is in the New Testament. You know the end of the biography we call the Gospel of Matthew? Jesus takes his disciples up on the hill in Galilee to give them the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says make disciples. There's a difference. Anyway, as he brings them there and he's giving them the Great Commission, they're standing there and Matthew says about them in verse 17. This is Matthew 28, 17. Some believed, but some doubted. What? He's standing resurrected right in front of them and they're doubting. It's like they're standing there going, you see that guy over there? Yeah, that guy over there is Jesus. Oh no, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. Look, Jesus is dead. It can't be him. The Romans killed him. I'm telling you, he's dead. It's him. You know what they did to him? They whipped him. They put nails in him. They put a spear in his side. Blood and water came out. I'm telling you, the guy is dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in the text. Jesus is not believed in by his own brothers. That's embarrassing to have your family not believe in you. In fact, his family thinks he's out of his mind, according to Mark chapter 3. We learn later, however, that James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called, man, you guys are sharp tonight. James actually dies as a martyr in the city of Jerusalem. He's thrown off the Temple Mount and stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in 62 AD, 30 years after the alleged resurrection. When prior to Jesus rising from the dead, he didn't think his own brother was God. By the way, you know who tells us this? It's not even in the New Testament. Josephus, the Jewish historian, and Hegesippus, another writer who lived later, they tell us what happened to James. Why would James actually convert to think his own brother was God? According to 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared to him resurrected. That convinced him. Before that, James said, yo, bro, you ain't God. After the resurrection, James said, yo, bro, you're God. Now, how many people in here have a brother? Now, how many people in here have a brother who thinks he's God? Yeah, you don't believe in him either. Didn't, James didn't either until he rose from the dead. And then Jesus is called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. You think they invented this? He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. The Messiah's bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. Now, you think Matthew, who wrote this down, said at one point, you know, I really think I need to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let me put a couple of prostitutes in there. What do you say, Rahab? Tamar. No. In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from? The tribe of Judah, not a good guy. You know what Judah did? He sold his brother Joseph into slavery into Egypt. And he slept with his daughter-in-law Tamar. And this guy's in the bloodline of the Messiah. By the way, why are we still talking about the Jews 3,500 years later, but we're not talking about the Amalekites or the Jebusites? Why are we still talking about the Jews? That's where we get the term Jew from. The Amalekites aren't together anymore. The Canaanites, the Midianites, the Jebusites, the Termites. We don't talk about these people. There's something supernatural about the Jews. David is in the bloodline. David, 
David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. I guess there's hope for the rest of us then. Bathsheba's in the bloodline, but Matthew won't mention her name. What does he say instead? Uriah's wife. He's telling the truth, but who's Uriah? Husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. He's telling the truth, but it's embarrassing. And then Jesus is hung on a tree. If you're making up a Messiah to the Jews, you don't hang him on a tree. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21, 23, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Well, Jesus, what is under God's curse? What curse? The curse of sin we put him under. But if you were making this up, you wouldn't say it. By the way, a few Bible students in here, stick with me for just a minute. Um, what are the two trees you see in Genesis early on? Tree of life and? Tree of life. Do you know there's a tree in the middle? It's the tree on which they hung Jesus. Because we sinned at the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, the only way we're going to have access again to the tree of life is if Jesus is hung on a tree in our place. But if you were making this up, you would never say this. There's a lot more embarrassing details, but we don't have time to go through it. We're going to do one more to show that the New Testament writers are telling the truth, and that is excruciating deaths. This is the argument that says that these men who were in a position to know whether Jesus had resurrected from the dead or not died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying, look, it never happened. Now, it's, ab it's absolutely critical to understand this. This is what a lot of just average, everyday folks who don't consider the Bible don't understand. The people that wrote the New Testament documents down, every one of them with the exception of Luke, were all Old Testament believing Jews. They thought they were God's chosen people. And there are two things they didn't think could happen. A man could not claim to be God, that would be blasphemy. And they didn't think one guy would rise from the dead in the middle of time. They knew everyone would rise from the dead at the end of time, but they didn't think one guy would rise from the dead at the end of time, or in the middle of time. And yet, these Old Testament believing Jews are suddenly declaring that a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead. What could have caused them to do this. And all you need to do is ask yourself some questions. What did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? They already thought they were God's chosen people. What did they get by saying Jesus claimed to be God and rose from the dead? They got kicked out of the synagogue and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? First, we'll get kicked out of the synagogue and then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. What a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this before? In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. Now, I get this question, and maybe you do if you're a Christian. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. They're not eyewitnesses, but they do corroborate what the New Testament says. They're all in chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But you know what is often underneath that question? An illicit assumption. Here's the illicit assumption. You really can't trust what the New Testament writers said because you see, they were biased. You can only trust the non-Christian writers to tell you what really happened. If you think about that for more than five seconds, you realize how stupid that objection is. What did these people have to gain by making this up? Nothing. They had everything to lose. In fact, some of you may know my friend Jay Warner Wallace. He's a cold case homicide detective who has been on Dateline more than any other homicide detective because he solves murders that are decades old. Jim is also a Christian who has a website, coldcasechristianity.com, a book by the same name, Cold Case, cold case Christianity, where he takes his detective, homicide detective skills and applies them to the greatest homicide of all time, the homicide of Jesus. And Jim says that whenever he finds a dead body that he knows has been murdered, he says, I know there's only three reasons why that guy's dead, or a combination of these three reasons. He says, I don't have to look for a thousand motivations as to why someone would want to murder this guy. I know it's one or more of these three. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sex, money, or power those are the three things that will motivate people to murder 
By the way, they're the same three things that motivate any of us to sin. Why? Because sex, money, and power are good things. In fact, they're so good, we'll often take shortcuts to get them. So Jim says, if you're going to say the New Testament writers invented all this, you've got to find one or more of those three motivators. So let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, did the New Testament writers suddenly get real popular with the ladies for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? No, they didn't get sex. Did they get money? No, they weren't 21st century prosperity gospel preachers. Did they get power? No, they got the opposite of power. They were persecuted. Paul had power when he was persecuting the church. As soon as he becomes a Christian, he's the one persecuted. He's the one that gets whipped. He's the one that gets beaten. He's the one that ultimately gets executed. They didn't get sex. They didn't get money. They didn't get power. There's no motive to make this up. They had everything to lose by saying it was true, and they said it was true anyway, and they paid with it with their blood. Why would they die for a known lie? You might say, wait a minute, Frank. If you're going to say that martyrdom somehow gives evidence for Christianity, don't you have to say it gives evidence for Islam? No. Why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. But I'm just going to give you one difference for our purposes. The Muslim martyrs of today haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. The New Testament martyrs, on the other hand, witness Jesus risen. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. No one will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. Now, the last thing I'm going to say about this is going to sound crazy to some of you, but stick with me. If you think the Bible's inerrant like I do, this is going to sound nuts for a minute, but it's not. Christianity is not true. Because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You say, how can that be? Because Christianity did not start with a book. Christianity started with an event. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why did people become Christians? Not because they read a book, but because they witnessed the resurrected Jesus or knew people who did. Then they wrote it down. In fact, you could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You would not have Jews in the first century writing that a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless... A man really did claim to be God and rose from the dead because this went completely against their belief system and then they go and die for it. Now, there's more in the books, but let's sum this whole thing up. Does truth exist? If somebody says there's no truth, you're going to say, is that? Of course there's truth. Does God exist? First argument. This is known as review. Cosmological. Second argument teleological and there's two aspects to that the universe and you third argument moral argument from these arguments we get a spaceless timeless immaterial powerful moral personal intelligent creator who created and sustains all things are miracles possible that what's the greatest miracle in the bible creation genesis 1 1 and even atheists are admitting the evidence for that is did Jesus really rise from the dead? Is the New Testament, are the New Testament documents historically reliable? They appear to be. We've only looked at two out of ten. If that's the case, then you can make an argument, which we do in the book, that if Jesus rose from the dead, that whatever he teaches is true. Jesus taught the entire Old Testament as the word of God, and he promised the New Testament. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to download this entire presentation. All you need to do is take out your phone on this uh, QR code, and it'll take you to a website. You put your email address in there, and we're going to send you the entire PowerPoint presentation in a PDF format. I'm actually going to send you about 10 PowerPoint presentations, not just this one. I've shown you maybe 60 slides. The whole thing has 362 slides. 
Uh, so if you would do that, um, we will send you that and a bunch of other great free stuff, okay? Uh, also, I want to point out that we do have some books on the book table, and uh, I want to point out as well that all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine, okay? Just so you know. In fact, one of them is here, and he's looking a little thin. So, in fact, he wrote one of the books up here. Zach Turek, right there. There he is. There he is. Raise your hand again, Zach. There he is. He's already been to seminary, even though he's a major in the Air Force. He's been to our seminary. We wrote this book last year. It's called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. You would be shocked to learn that the top movie franchises of the past 50 years, despite the fact that Hollywood puts out a lot of junk, we know that, but the top movie franchises, the really successful ones, they've stolen from the greatest story ever told, the story of Jesus. I don't care if you're talking about Captain America, Iron Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. <gasps> Harry Potter? You would be shocked to learn the parallels in Harry Potter. In fact, J.K. Rowling says she took the story from the Bible. Okay? So if you know anyone that likes movies, they're going to love this because it's going to direct them right to Jesus. The ultimate hero is who? Jesus, of course. This is the book we've been talking about tonight. It goes through it in a lot of detail. There's a 12-part DVD series uh, where I'm presenting it. It's about seven hours long. If you go to our website, you can also get workbooks with it, small groups, Sunday school, uh, homeschool, that kind of thing. So that's all there. We're now teaching online courses. In fact, this week we're starting a new online course in Galatians. I'll be your instructor if you want to join. You still have time to join. And if you take the premium version, we're going to be together on six occasions on Zoom for live Q&A. There's a bunch of others, like 25 courses up there. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we've combined these three into one social media platform. We call it you TwitFace. <laughs> have you guys signed up for you TwitFace yet? It's kind of a Jersey thing um, from New Jersey originally. Uh, we're also on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, don't forget about the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast and then TV on Wednesday nights. And if you don't do anything else, download the free cross examined app, two words in the App Store. And not only has the TV show streaming and the podcast streaming, there's even a quick answer section on there. So you might be having lunch with somebody, a non Christian, and they throw an objection at you. You don't know how to handle it. All you need to do is take out your droid or your iPhone and go, hey, hang on. I'm getting a text. Hey, what about this? It's right there. All right. Before you get to your questions, let's sum the whole thing up. It's true. So what? So what if Christianity is true? Well, the best news of all, someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in naval aviation, and we had to earn uh, golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn. But there's nothing more difficult in the Navy and maybe any military to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through. Maybe 5%. Those that do make it through wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery in San Diego, California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took their tridents, and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that sacrificed for them, the one that died for them. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to put our identity in our Savior. But of course, our culture says, oh no, put your identity in your sexual preference or your gender identity or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your political party or your ethnic group or your job, your vocation. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, none of those things are ultimate? If you put your identity in your sexual preference, what happens when you can no longer sexually perform? You no longer have an identity? Or you're no longer sexually preferred? You no longer have an identity? You put your identity in a job. What happens when you lose the job? You don't have an identity? You put your identity in another person. What happens if, God forbid, that person leaves you or dies? You no longer have an identity? No, your identity is meant to be in your Savior. Every other worldview asks you to achieve your identity. Christianity says you just receive your identity. 
If you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you. And there's always somebody that can do it better. But if you simply receive your identity, all the pressure's off, and it's something you can't lose. Look, you can lose everything in this life. Ultimately, you will lose your life. The only thing you can't lose is Jesus, who not only died, but rose again. And he said that by trusting in him, you'll not only be forgiven, you will be given his righteousness. That's a secure identity. And it's something you can't lose. If you've never accepted that, why wouldn't you? It's eternal. It's unwavering. It's unshakable. And it's free. And best of all, it's true. Now, before we go to questions, Jaden, why don't you come up and tell folks about, uh, on the mic right there, about TPUSA. We want people to get involved. We don't just want this to be an event. Tell them about it a little bit and when they can meet with you. Big speakers, but... This one really touched home personally for me because I feel like ultimately nothing I do matters outside of Christ. And so I want everyone to experience that. So next steps could be obviously getting involved with Turning Point USA. We're a great group of people. You know, we're not like a ministry, but uh, we love Jesus. Um, and there's, a, there's other ministries as well. There's Chi Alpha um, that I'm a part of. I lead a Bible study for Chi Alpha. We have worship on Wednesday nights at the AU Chapel. If you want to get involved with that, what come. What time? Uh, that's at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. AU Chapel, Wednesday nights. Yes, sir. What about TPUSA? When's that? Yeah, TPUSA meets every other Tuesday. Every other Tuesday? Yeah, at 5.30 in uh, Louder, um, what's it? Louder 152, okay? Louder 152. And there's other ministries. There's RUF, um, you know, there's, uh, the, which is the more reformed one. You have uh-huh. uh, Auburn Catholics. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ministries. I'm just telling you the one that I'm involved with, but... Um, if you are interested, there are people at the front, volunteers who are involved in ministries. Um, ultimately, this event does not matter unless you get involved, right? Fellowship is what's going to get you in the kingdom. So find people that, that agree with you, that, have, that share that faith. And um, if you unite on that, you know, you'll secure your spot in heaven, of course. So, uh, yeah, but thank you, Frank, for thank coming. Thank you, Jaden. Yeah, thank you. All right, and uh, at, the, at the table out there, there are materials you can get if you want to go further. So you want to say something, Ava? Go ahead. Oh, Mike's a little bit quiet? Okay, all right. All right, let's go to questions. And since no one likes to ask the first question, let's move right on to the second question. (laughs) Second question, just go to the microphone so everybody can hear you, not just here, but also in Internet land. And just line up behind the questioner so we don't have to wait for people to get up and come down to the mic. Yes, sir, what's your name? Uh, I'm Gavin. Gavin Gavin. Dimmitt. Gavin. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Um, So I'm a Catholic. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, like, why aren't you a Catholic? Well, uh, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> look, I grew up in New Jersey, mm-hmm. and so I was Catholic because it's the law. <laughs> look, you're either Catholic or you're Jewish in New Jersey. I went to Catholic high school. I always believed in God. I knew there had to be a first cause. But I never knew who Jesus was. I was never taught, at least maybe it was just me, maybe I was a dunderhead and I didn't know, but I just didn't figure out who Jesus was. I went to college, I went into the Navy after college, and while in flight training, I met the son of a Methodist minister. And he took me to a Baptist service of all things, and I said, well, I'm learning something here. And then I had so many questions for him, he finally said, look, you just need to get Josh McDowell books. Evidence demands a verdict in more than a carpenter. So I got those books and I realized Christianity was true. And then when I got out of the Navy, I ran, into, I ran into Norman Geisler, who at the time was the Michael Jordan of apologetics. And he was starting a seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, called Southern Evangelical Seminary. It's still a great place to get an education. SES.edu forward slash Frank. You can get a scholarship by doing that, okay? And so I, my wife and I and three sons, Zach was only five years old at the time. He's 35 now. Uh, we moved down from D.C. to, uh, to uh, Charlotte to attend the seminary, and then I began doing seminars with Dr. Geiser, writing books like I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But my, I have a lot of respect for the Catholic Church, the history of the Catholic Church. One of the greatest theologians of all time is Aquinas. There's a lot of good that comes out of the Catholic Church, but there are some things that I just don't think are biblical. 
And one of the problems with the Catholic Church, in my view anyway, is they conflate, they put together what is known as justification and sanctification. Justification is how you get saved, and that's supposed to happen instantaneously. But sanctification is a long-term process going through life, becoming more and more like Jesus. And I think it confuses people in the pew in particular. Because if you ask an average Catholic, I don't know if you're like this or not, but if you ask an average Catholic, how do you get to heaven, what are they going to say? Uh, don't, don't sin? Yeah, they're, well, we all sin. So Be a good person? Yeah, be a good person. That's what they're going to say. That's not what the Bible teaches. None of us are going to get to heaven by being a good person. Jesus said there's only one good, and that is God. The rest of us are sinners. That's why he had to come. That's why he had to sacrifice his life. And by trusting in him, we can be forgiven and given his righteousness. And so while you'll find a hundred different ways to qualify how Roman Catholicism is not in error on certain items, I think at a practical level, the people in the pews in a Roman Catholic church don't know how to get to heaven. There may be exceptions to that. My mom's Catholic. She knows. But I talk to her about it, right? And uh, so I think that's a problem. In fact, I don't, I, it may be different here. I'm just going to tell you my experience. I've been to hundreds of masses. Hundreds. The only time I ever heard the gospel was the last one I went to, and it was my father's funeral. And the priest got up and he said, I talked to Frank the other day. He knows Jesus as his Lord and Savior, so he's with him right now. He didn't tell t- anything about good works or the sacraments or any of that. That Catholic priest knew the gospel. But it was the only time I've ever heard it. So, as I say, I have a lot of respect. I, I like a lot of things, but the gospel's too big for me to give up if that makes any sense. Yes, sir, it does. All right, thank you. Thanks for being here. Hello. um, Yes, sir, what's your name? Liam. Liam, go Um, ahead. My question is, you give three arguments. Um, One of the ones I find the most interesting is not one that you mentioned, that Uh being Anselm's ontological argument. Yes. What is, I know that it's a bit controversial and some yes. people disagree on how valid it is. Yes. What is your opinion on the ontological argument? Well, I don't really have a strong opinion for that very reason you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there are brilliant scholars on both sides that come to opposite conclusions. Mm-hmm. And you, you, there are much better arguments, in my view, for the existence of God than the ontological argument. So why use one that is questionable, at least in the minds of many? But if you want a good sort of um, quick explanation of the ontological argument, Dr. William Lane Craig at reasonablefaith.org has put together through a friend of mine, Jim Zangmeister, uh, these animated videos on all the major arguments. And the one on the ontological argument you ought to watch, as well as the cosmological, teleological, and moral arguments. They're like six, seven minute videos, and they kind of give a good overall view of the ontological argument. But I don't use it just for that very reason you mentioned. Well, I understand that. I was just wondering if you had like a strong opinion either way. I think Anselm does a really good job with it. Yeah, I haven't read Anselm on it, but if anyone is the person to read it is Anselm. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, there is a, a gentleman by the name of Alex O'Connor. I don't know if you've heard of Alex O'Connor. He's the used to be called the cosmic skeptic, young, brilliant kid who was an atheist. Uh, I had a dialogue with him on the Justin Brierley show about six years ago in London. And um, the argument that has him intrigued that God might exist is the ontological argument. So it, it might be for some, right? Yes, sir. All right, so an important... What's your name? Dre. My name is Dre. Dre. Dre Watkins. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. So an important part of Christianity, or ex- actually salvation and all, is actually knowing who Jesus Christ actually is. Yeah. And I feel like a big portion of that is a lot of people in this world kind of make out their own Jesus. And I feel like it's, it's hard in a sense of like explaining the Trinity to someone who is probably a younger Christian and... I feel like just saying three persons, one being isn't like it, it, it doesn't help. I'm speaking to a group of younger men and I, that co- question right, came me, up let, and I was like, man, I don't, I don't know a better way Let me give you maybe a way it. of looking at the Trinity. There's no perfect way of looking at it because it's not against reason, but it is to a certain extent beyond reason. 
But you would expect that. It would be strange if an infinite God wasn't strange to us, right? Here's a way of looking at the Trinity. Think of a triangle where you've got, obviously, three corners to the triangle, but you have one triangle. Think of the divine nature uh, in the heart of the triangle here, and you have, in each corner, a different member of the Trinity, person of the Trinity. You have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, over here, attached to the divine nature, but not intermingling with the divine nature, is a human nature. That's the Son. That's Jesus. In other words, uh, what you just said there is that you have one God with three persons. They share a divine nature. They're all equally God. But Jesus actually has two natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature. So, Whenever you ask a question about Jesus, you always, ask to ask, you always have to ask two questions because people will say, well, how could Jesus be God if he died, right? Well, did Jesus die as God? No, but did he die as man? Yes. How could Jesus be God if he didn't know when he was coming back? Did Jesus know when he was coming back as God? Yes, but as man, no. Did Jesus get hungry as God? No, as man, yes. Did Jesus get tired as God? No, as man, yes. In other words, there's always two questions you have to ask. Now, another way of looking at it is to say that God is one what with three who's. But Jesus, who too, is one who with two what's. He's got a what one and a what two. So whenever you're talking about who two, you've got to say what, what are you talking about? You're talking about what one or what two. This is Abbott and Costello theology, by the way, okay? All right? So... This, in my view, although I would never would have dreamed this up, and this is what C.S. Lewis says. He says, well, there are people out there, like maybe Muslims, who say, well, our God is much simpler. And Lewis says, well, it's simpler because if you're inventing gods, of course you can make God simple. But we're not inventing a God here. Who would ever, who would ever come up with this? Okay? This appears actually to be a solution to many problems. Why? Because if God was just one person... How could he be loved? There's no one to love prior to him creating. But if God's a trinity, if he's three persons in one divine essence, he's a lover, a loved one, and a spirit of love. He has perfect love from all eternity. This is also, by the way, the model for human relationships. You know, a lot of people, and I'm going to step on some toes here, but a lot of people don't like what the Bible says about man-woman relationships. That the man is supposed to be have a certain function in the home and the woman a certain function in the home. That's the same thing in the Trinity. Do you know the Father and the Son are both equally God? But the Son willingly takes a submissive role in the fact that he does what the Father wants him to do. And Kathy Keller, who was the wife of Tim Keller, Tim Keller, a brilliant theologian uh, who passed away earlier this year, Kathy Keller used to say this, and probably still does, she says... If you're saying that you can't take a subordinate functional role to someone else, you're saying you can't be like Jesus. Because Jesus submitted his own will to that of the Father. Now notice the Father never asked Jesus to do something immoral. If you're in a marriage relationship and your husband tells you to do something immoral, you disobey. It's only talking about moral things here. And my wife and I, we could probably think of two or three occasions where I had to make the call. Okay, most of the time you can work stuff out, right? But as C.S. Lewis pointed out, if you've got a, a constitution of two people and there's a disagreement, there's no majority rule. Someone has to be designated as the tiebreaker. And God has made that the man. God has also told the man that the man needs to sacrifice himself for his wife. And he all, he tell, all he says to the woman is just respect your husband. The man has to lay down his life. That's the harder role, actually, if it's done properly. So, go ahead. And the last, mm -hmm. the last piece of that, uh -huh. kind of pairing with that, it, you mentioned uh, Jesus add humanity to his deity. Yes. And I, I feel like if I were to be asked the question, well, does that not kind of sound like, Jesus being created, I know a lot of... Jesus, religions. his human nature was created, yeah, 2,000 years ago. But his divine nature is eternal. This nature came into the world. Now, he, there was pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament, but when he came through Mary, this was created. So that, being, that 
Human nature is created. Divine nature, no. The divine nature created everything else according to Colossians 1. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. And that and for other reasons. Right? Jesus created all things. All right? Gotcha. By the way, I know this is going to sound odd, but the best chapter you'll read anywhere on the Trinity is found in a book called Answering Islam by Norman Geisler and Abdul Salib. Answering Islam. Why is that the best chapter? Because one of the hang-ups Muslims have on Christianity is the Trinity. And so Dr. Geisler and a converted Muslim to Christianity who changed his name to Abdul Salib because if he didn't, he'd probably be hunted down and killed for converting to Christianity. They got together and wrote this book on how to talk to Muslims about the gospel. And people that I know who do this a lot say that's the best book on the topic. So get that book, Answering Islam. Yes, sir, what's your name? Hey, Frank, my name is Walt. Walt just wanted to get just an opinion from you. I've been for a long time frustrated with the church because uh -huh. I feel like the church has allowed pro-abortionists to take over the term pro-choice uh -huh. because the choice really happens to have sex or not to have sex. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take that back and use that? Oh, you can. You can do that. But look, we can have all these rhetorical arguments on that issue. I'm going to tell you the most powerful argument is a one-minute video. It's a one-minute video found on caseforlife.com. It's the video that my friend Scott Klusendorf, who speaks quite a bit at crisis pregnancy centers, uses. It's one minute and seven seconds. And when you look at that video, if you still think a woman has the choice to kill what's inside her womb, I'm not sure you have a conscience because it's gonna show you an abortion in every trimester. And you will see what abortion is. And there haven't been any major moral developments without imagery. Do you know what gave us the civil rights movement? The horrific murder of Emmett Till. You guys know who Emmett Till was? It's like a 15 year old kid who went down to visit his cousin in Mississippi. He was from, he was from Chicago and white supremacists murdered him and they tied something around his neck threw him in a river and he was found and the sheriff called his mother and his mother said please put him in a coffin and put him on the train send him up to me in chicago and when the body got to chicago she said we're going to do an open casket funeral despite the fact he was horribly disfigured she said I want I want the world to see what they did to my baby that found its way to Jet magazine in I think 1956 and eight years later that was the impetus eight years later we got the civil rights legislation in 1964 you need imagery to wake people up. And so the same thing is true with abortion. All right. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Name? Frank. Uh, my name is Paul. First of all, I want to apologize for my phone going off earlier. That's all uh, right, man. It's it, it, it right out of attention. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> um, one of the biggest problems I have, and I've watched a ton of your videos, a ton of Jay Werner Wallace's videos, stuff from Greg Kokel. One of the biggest problems I have found is that oftentimes the atheist will uh, either refuse to see the problem or they want to be so stuck in their view that they refuse to admit something. At what point would you say, okay, you know, as the Bible says, at this point, I'm casting pearls before a swine. Well, I wouldn't say that to them. No, not to them, <laughs> obviously. But yeah. internally, and just say, you know what? Um, I, I would ask them the question I mentioned earlier. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Or if Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God, would you follow him? If they hesitate or say no, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. And I don't know about you, but... When you look at the internet and you look at, say, YouTube comments, Instagram comments, 
most of the objections to God are emotional. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I, 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 it, I'm being generous to say 5% of the comments have any substance to them. Yeah. Most of them are ad hominem attacks on the apologist. Or oh. they'll say something, logical fallacy, and they don't explain why. I, right. I, I get that a lot. I, okay. You know, there's this two particular that I have gotten into discussions with on Facebook. Uh -huh. and that was your first mistake. <laughs> Um, here's a, here's a couple of things you can do when this happens. Okay, you ask somebody if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? They hesitate or say no. Here's four things you can do. There's probably more, but these are just four I think of, okay? Number one, pray. Pray for them. Mm -hmm. You should always pray. Number two, plant seeds when you can. Not all the time, but plant seeds that might show them why their worldview is wrong and why Christianity is true. Number three, love them. That doesn't mean approve of everything they do, like we right. mentioned earlier. Right. And then number four, wait. Why wait? Because not everybody is at the same, on the same journey in the same place as you are. In fact, how many people in here are Christians? All right. How many people in here um, have had different periods when you're pursuing God and not pursuing God? Yeah, like all of us, right? Yeah. Why do we expect everybody to be exactly where we are when we talk to them? Right? I mean, people will say, hey, Frank, I see a lot of your videos, and you don't get mad at kids that, you know, are maybe rude. And then I said, well, why would I? Why should I expect a 21-year-old kid to agree with me at 61? I didn't agree with my 61-year-old self when I was 21. Okay? As Paul said, I was an insolent and arrogant man, but Christ showed me mercy. So just remember, everybody's on their own journey. And it might be now they're not interested or they're resistant. But if, if you pray for them, plant seeds, love them, and then wait, if they're ever going to be open, it might be when tragedy strikes. And tragedy is going to strike all of us at some point. When that happens, if that person becomes open, your phone's going to ring and that person's going to be on the other end. They're not going to call their atheist friend and say, hey, you know, what's the reason for this? <laughs> what's the atheist going to say? There's no rhyme or reason to life. This stuff just happens. Tough. Get over it. No, they're going to call you a person of spiritual depth because when the student's ready, the teacher will be summoned. So just wait and continue to pray. Thanks. All right, thanks. Yes, sir, what's your name? Hi, Dr. Turek. Um, my name's Daniel. Daniel, go ahead. Yes, so my question is, I believe that the Bible teaches that the earth is young, uh -huh. 6,000 years old specifically. I was wondering why you believe that creation was caused by the Big Bang. Okay, well, I'm absolutely convinced the universe is at least 61 years old. <laughs> all right, when I throw my mom in there, it's at least 85. All right? Um, well, let me ask you this. Let's talk about the, uh, the Bible first. What does the first verse of the Bible say? In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens That's and the earth. Now, there was no word in Hebrew for universe. Heavens and earth was what it meant. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? In According the to that. In, in the, the beginning, beginning, right? Yeah. Does it say when the beginning was? Not specifically. No. Then the next verse says, and the earth was formless and void. Wait, we've gone from the whole universe in, in verse 1 to now the earth. How long did that take? Doesn't say, right? The days begin in verse 3, but if we were to take a literal view of Genesis, the universe is created before the days ever begin. Okay, this is why John Lennox says in his book, Seven Days to Divide the World, he says, the Bible leaves the age of the universe indeterminate because it says the universe is created even before the days begin. There's another thing to think about here. And we can't go through the whole book right now, but I'm just thinking of a, a, another thing. Um, who was Genesis written to? It's not written to us. It was written to people who had just left Egypt, right, after 400 years of slavery. When they're walking through the desert, they're not thinking of the questions we're thinking of. They're not walking through the desert going, hey, I wonder how old this place is. You know, that, that's not their question. Their question is, who is the true God? Is Yahweh the true God or the gods of Egypt the true God? And when you look at the Egyptian creation stories, it appears that the Genesis creation story is a polemic or a corrective 
on the Egyptian creation stories. See, Egyptian creation stories have these finite gods in the universe who have to battle one another to bring order to chaos. Moses says, nope, God's outside the universe. He doesn't battle anyone. He just speaks, and he brings order to chaos. So there is scholarship now saying that Genesis 1 appears to be a polemic against the Egyptian gods. It's not intended for us to add the days up. And it, by the way, the seventh day is longer than 24 hours because we're still in it. So even if you were to try and add the days up, you're, you're not sure you're going to wind up at a short period of time. The bottom line is this. Does it really matter how old the universe is to salvation? No, it doesn't. I mean, you could be right. It's possible to interpret the Bible the way young earthers uh, view it but it's also possible the way old earthers view it. And by the way, we use evidence from both nature and the Bible to figure out what the truth is because God has revealed uh, himself in nature, as we've seen, and also in the Bible. And sometimes we use nature to interpret the Bible. Why? Well, does anyone here really think that the sun rises and sets? Or is it, when the Bible says that, does the Bible re is it really teaching that the sun rises and sets? No, it's using an observational point of view. It, it's not literally meaning that it's rising and setting. But we do that now even in our scientific age, right? In our scientific age, we still say sunrise and sunset. You know, you watch the uh, news tonight, the guy's going to say, you know, sunrise tomorrow at 722. He's not going to say earth rotation will become apparent <laughs> at 722. So I think that we have to use both revelations to figure out what the truth is, if that makes any sense. So why not take, like, take it literally? Why not take the seven days literally? I just did, though. I just took the whole thing literally. That the, heaven, the, the universe is created before we even get to the days. That's what I mean. Isn't that putting, like, limits on God's power, though? No. If. Why? Why it's putting limits on so God's power? So if you say, if. If you claim that God created the Big Bang, but then if you say that the Big Bang happened uh -huh. and then all of creation came from that, why would it enumerate God creating everything specifically later on? Well, first of all, God didn't need seven days. He could have done it in seven milliseconds, right? Or instantaneously. Yeah, But he could have. what would happen if God just created every... I had this question the other night. Someone said, well, you know, Adam was created fully grown, right? I mean, he wasn't a baby, he couldn't survive, so he already had a parent age. God, could, couldn't God have done that with the universe? Sure he could have. Mm -hmm. He could have done that with the universe. The problem is, how would we know the universe was created then? If everything was created instantaneously, we wouldn't know it was created. But if it originates from a single point and expands out and is still expanding, we can actually see the creation event or effects of the creation event and know it was created. So by the way God did it left evidence out there that we can detect and say, ah, Genesis 1-1 is true. We're looking through our telescopes and seeing it. Does that make sense? What? All right, keep thinking about it. Appreciate get it. Thank you get uh, Lennox's <coughs> book. You'll like it. Seven Days to Divide the World. Thank you. All right, thanks, Daniel. Yes, ma'am. I'm so short. That's all right. You got it. Go ahead. Hi, What's your Frank. name? Uh, my name is Shashmita. Shashmita? Yes. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, so I, I have a few, not a few questions, but one big question. Uh -huh. I've come here from Africa to Alabama, and then I've realized that so many people focus on Acts 2, and then they say that that is the evidence of the Holy Spirit, uh -huh. that speaking in tongues uh -huh. is the Holy Spirit. But then when they do speak in tongues, uh -huh. it's not according to what the Bible says it is. So how do I refute that? Because they just stick to the King James Version, mm -hmm. and then they just go to Acts 2, and then they just stop at verse 2, and they don't want to continue from there. And I'm like, the whole chapter is there for you to read. So, yes, you're, And you're, it's like big pastors that teach that. So I know, I, I know. You're, you're, you're wise to observe that in Acts 2, in fact, every time tongues happen in Acts, it's another language. Mm. where people are able to speak in another language to pass the gospel to somebody they normally couldn't talk to. That's what the entire book of Acts is about. 
It's not this private prayer language that people practice today. Now, some say 1 Corinthians 14 is a private prayer language. Yeah. Perhaps that's true, but let me give you a reference on this. There's a, a website and an app called Got Questions. It, it has an article on just about every question you could imagine. If you go there to Got Questions and type in tongues, you'll get probably 15 or 20 articles. Okay. And if you read those articles, you may not agree with everything they say, but I think they give a good overview of what tongues really is. In my view, tongues is always a known language. I and agree. I think that happens today. Craig Keener has detected that. But it happens in certain areas when people have to get the gospel to other people. Mm -hmm. I don't think people have the gift of tongues like they had it in the first century, but if God wants to speak through somebody a language they can't mm -hmm. normally speak mm -hmm. in order to get somebody else the gospel, he can still do that and is doing that today. I mean, I agree. And then what would you say the evidence of the Holy Spirit is then? Having the Holy Spirit on you, what uh -huh. would the evidence be of that? How would you know that you do have the Holy Spirit? How would you know you do have yeah, the Holy Spirit? Well, now we're, now we're getting into, is there a difference between the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit, mm. right? Uh, I think you know intuitively that you have the Holy Spirit once you believe, because Ephesians 1 says he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit, okay? okay. Um, the filling of the Holy Spirit, that's a little bit controversial, and the Pentecostal friends in here... Um, may take that to say, well, you know, you've got to experience, do certain things to demonstrate you have the filling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have a firm position on that, but I think the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you intuitively know that Christianity is true. Okay. But see, there's a difference between knowing Christianity is true and showing Christianity is true. Okay. You can know something's true and not be able to show it. You just have a personal experience. You can't share that experience with somebody else, right? Yeah, true. Okay this feeling or this, this uh, witness of the Holy Spirit, you can't share that. But you can share the evidence that we just mentioned Yeah. that says that Christianity is indeed true. Okay. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great questions. Yes, sir. What's your name? Logan. Logan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, put them both up if you would. Right. Thanks, Logan. First of all, I just want to say it's an honor to be here. Uh, found out through YouTube notification that you were in Auburn, so zip down here as quick as I could. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, and also, I've never been able to find out who puts on the music on your YouTube shorts, so shout out to whoever does that. All right. Um, yeah, that would be people like Jorge and Phoenix and Diego and Maria. We've got a whole team, and they're great at it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, question is, are there prophets today, or is that a thing of the past that has... Prophets? Yes, prophets. What do you mean by prophecy? Um... I guess because we when normally we think of prophets as someone telling the future. In reality, most prophecy is people speaking the word of God into a culture in order to say, "Wake up." Right? Mm -hmm. It's not foretelling the future, it's trying to wake people up like Jeremiah tried to do that, right? Yes. Okay, do I think there are people out there doing that right now? Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of people uh, doing that right now. Okay? Yeah. My friend Jack Hibbs is doing that. In fact, he was just on Charlie Kirk's show today. Charlie does some of that. Any good preacher uh, can wake people up to the truth of the scriptures. So there's plenty of people out there doing that. Now, if you're going to ask me, are there apostles today? No. Apostles are people that could add to the Bible. Mm. Apostles passed away in the first century, so they're gone. In fact, you know, some... Pentecostal people will say there are apostles today. And I asked a, a, a Pentecostal friend of mine, I said, hey, do you think there are still apostles? He goes, I don't even think we have elders. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, the church is so infantile so many times. Okay. All right? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am, what's your name? Uh, my name is Gabriella. Hey, Gabriella. So I understand that you're a very logical person, Bible person. You believe miracles are possible. Yes. And I was just curious what your opinion is on John 6. So in John 6, Jesus says, I am the, I am the bread of life. Yep. You must eat my flesh and blood yep. in order to receive salvation. He goes on this, and then his disciples say, that's a hard teaching. How can we accept that? Mm -hmm. And then he says, oh, no, I insist. That's true. That's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And most of his followers will leave him. 
And most what? what? Most of his followers yeah. leave him because of that teaching. Right. How do you interpret that? Do you believe that it's symbolic or that it's literal? Because if, if it's symbolic, it, it wouldn't make sense for Jesus to insist on it so much. Right. Well, what he, the question is, it, it could still make sense in the sense that he's saying when he says he's the bread of life. By the way, that passage in, in, um, in John 6 has just come after he fed the 5,000 by multiplying the loaves. Yes. Right? So now he's saying, I'm the bread of life. You need to feed on me, not just the bread that you eat every day. Yeah. So I think it was metaphorical because uh, later on when he says at the Last Supper he's holding up the, uh, the bread, he says, this is my body which has been pierced for your sins. That, he's holding bread in his hand. He's not holding his body. It, he's speaking, I think, symbolically. Now, of course, Christians are going to disagree with this. Roman Catholics are going to disagree with this. Greek Orthodox may disagree with this. Even some Lutherans believe in so-called transubstantiation. It's not something I'm going to divide over, okay? But I think what's going on there in John chapter 6 is he is saying that the commitment that you have to me, it has to be absolute. Because elsewhere he says what? If you don't hate your mother and father uh, and it compared to me, you can't be my disciple. You've got to take up your cross and follow me. You've got to deny yourself. This is just another way of saying that I am what you need to follow, not a whole bunch of rites and rituals. You just need to follow me. Because you see, the Protestants, most of the Protestants are going to say that baptism and communion are memorials. They're symbolic of the truth that Jesus sacrificed himself uh, in order to pay for our sins. Uh, Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, and some Lutherans are going to say, no, that's a sacrament that you need in order to be saved. What's your position on it? So I am Roman Catholic. Okay. And in my opinion, the, that scripture, if, if it had been symbolic, he wouldn't have lost his followers over it. If it were that big of a deal, he wouldn't have... Let, he wouldn't have let a symbol alone let his followers go. He would Why have let not? His followers what, what if he meant that you need to follow me at all costs? You need to, I am, I am the, and that's another thing he said, of course. Yeah. He's quoting from Exodus 3.14 when God appeared to Charlton Heston. You remember that. Um, <laughs> he's saying that I am the way to salvation. He also said I am the door. I am the shepherd, I yes. am the judge, I yes. am the light. You know, these aren't literal. He, yes, he also right. said you need to lay down your life for your friends. Mm -hmm. and, but his followers didn't leave him after that. But they left him after mm -hmm. he said, you need to eat my flesh and drink, mm -hmm. drink my blood, which obviously was really controversial. And in really the, in embarrassing the, in the, in the, too, right? And really embarrassing. That's in, right. In the not, he's not making that up, that's for sure. It's, we know exactly. that was, he said that. Yeah. So hey, we can agree to disagree on that. That's totally fine. Okay. I just want your opinion. I'm yeah. just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, were. thank you. By the way, there is a great book you might be interested in, okay. and you might be interested in it too. It's called Roman Catholics and Evangelicals, Agreements and Differences. And it was written by Norman Geiser and Ralph McKenzie. Both were originally Roman Catholic. They became Protestant, but they got endorsements from Roman Catholics on the book. So it's a fair book. It's 25 years old. It's been around a long time. But if you want to know where Roman Catholics and Evangelicals agree and where they disagree and why, check that out. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Great question, Gabriel. Hi, yes, sir. Kurt. What's your name? My name is Drew. Drew, um, This might be too broad of a question, but uh -huh. I was going to ask, in your personal experience, what was the most difficult objection to Christianity to work through, and how did you work through it? Well, the most difficult objection, I think, for most is probably, um, you mean for me or for the culture now? What's yes, sir, you personally. Oh, well, why does God allow certain evils? Not why does God allow evil. We know why he allows evil, because we have free will. And if he doesn't allow evil, we don't really have free will. But why does God allow certain horrific evils to occur? And the way I worked through it was doing a lot of reading and realized there's something known as the ripple effect that every event ripples forward to affect trillions of other events. And because I can't see a good reason why this event occurred doesn't mean it won't bring good later. I can't see it, but I'm in time, and I can see very little. But 
God's outside of time. He can see how it all works together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And one way of looking at the ripple effect, think about if you're sitting here in this room right now, you're thinking, well, how did I get here? How did you get here? Well, your parents had to meet and their parents had to meet and their parents. Think about how many ripples just in your parents and grandparents and great parents meeting for you to be here. All those ripples brought at least are partially responsible for you sitting here tonight. We can't trace all those ripples, but God can. So he can allow certain things to happen that we go, I, that's a head scratcher. I don't see why that can happen, but I know why. I, I don't know why. I'm yes, inside sir. of time. He's outside. So that's Thank probably you. the biggest issue. Thanks, Drew. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hi, I'm Rachel. Go ahead, Rachel. So I have a friend um, who she's grown up in the church, but um, she's not she's not saved. Uh huh. Um, and um, something that tends to um, that she tends to stop on is she's worried about the Bible not being authentic, not because she doesn't believe it isn't originally the Word of God, but because it's been translated by fallible men. Okay. What what would you what would you advise? As yeah, an great argument? question. When somebody says something, it's not your job to refute what they say; it's their job to support what they say. So when she says it's been translated, uh, first question I want to ask is, what do you mean by that? What do you mean it's been translated? Secondly, how did you come to that conclusion? And see what she says, because she needs to support her position. The Bible hasn't been translated from one language to another language to another language to another language, and then you get English. Mm. We take it right from the original uh, copies of the originals, the Greek and the Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic in the book of Daniel, and we can translate that right into English. Okay, so there's not this big, long translation problem that people think about. Mm. They may think we got the Bible through the telephone game, you know, the old telephone game. That's not how we got the Bible. So they may think that. That's why you got to ask them, what do you mean by being translated? And secondly, this sounds almost similar to an objection you'll get. Well, I can't trust the Bible because it was written by men. The response to that is, you're a man or a woman. Why should I believe what you just said? Just because something is said or written by men or women doesn't mean it's necessarily false. If that were the case, what they just said would be necessarily false. You have to evaluate what's said by people to discover whether or not it's true. So it's a self-defeating claim to say, well, because it's written by men, I can't believe it. In fact, you might even ask that person, do you have any books in your library? Yeah, I do. Do you get any useful information from those books? Yeah, I do. They're written by men. How did, how did you get useful information from those books? Okay, so I think you might want to point that out to them. And then also, don't forget to ask the question, if it really were true, would you become a Christian? Because a lot of times people are using slogans they've heard in order to avoid the truth. And as soon as you ask them for evidence for the slogan, they can't give you any evidence. So always ask those questions. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? By the way, the third question I didn't really mention is, have you ever considered, have you ever considered we didn't get the Bible like the telephone game? The way, the way we got the Bible was we took all the manuscripts that had been written and we compared them and we reconstructed the original. And we can do that with 99.5% accuracy. And the 0.5% we don't know about doesn't affect any major doctrine. So... That's a, f a nice way of you providing evidence back, okay? By the way, those three questions are from Greg Kokel's book, Tactics. They're also in our cross-examined app, two words in the app store, cross-examined. And friends, by the way, you can use these questions with anything, not just questions about religion or Christianity. So parents, suppose, uh, you know, your fathers, you know, your son calls you one night and says, Dad, I'm not going to be home by 11 like you wanted me to. Don't panic. First question, what do you mean by that? Second question, how'd you come to that conclusion? <laughs> Third question, have you ever considered if you're not home by 11, you're grounded for two, three weeks? Be right home, Dad, right? By the way, husbands, 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 nev never use these questions on your wives, <laughs> never. If your wife calls you an idiot, don't say, what do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? My wife will have a list 38 years long. Okay, so. Thank right, you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Frank, how are you? Hey, good, what's your name? My name's Jason. Jason, go ahead. Uh, so um, I've had, uh, during my walk, one of the things that I've uh, noticed is uh, we get into a discussion all the time about uh, faith versus works. I mean, it's, it's well documented in Romans. Mm -hmm. The differences between them, we understand that. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you, you know, talk to friends or whatever, 
there's this sense anyway with uh, people that I talk to over the years, you know, yeah, there's still that sense that I need to do good or whatever even once I come to Christ, you know, after I'm done. And yet... Um, you do, the, but the, 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 what's the motivation? Yeah, the so, the, so the actual uh, point I was going to make yeah. is the thief on the cross yeah. was, is what I think like the most pure sense of what Jesus gave to mm-hmm. anybody who comes, into, mm-hmm. comes to him in faith mm-hmm. and just trusting that he is going to you know, take care of you. Sure. And, and uh, he loved us enough to come for us, so we should do that for others too. Yes. The point that I'm making is that it's, we, I think there's like this conflation of the need to have to do things after, instead of just resting in the spirit, that the spirit is going to move me in a way to love others or you know, go to church or take care of the people that are around me in the sense that it's not me doing it, it's the spirit leading me. So the point I'm making is that I just feel like there's this conflation that gets people confused as to what true salvation is. Yes, I, I think Martin Luther put it best that you're saved by faith alone, but your faith is not alone. That you're going to do good works as a result of this. And this is what Paul says in, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, where he says that salvation is a gift, and it, you don't get it by works, but then you're prepared to do good works. Unto good works. Right, yeah, right. unto good works, right. okay? And we're doing good works out of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. We're not doing it out of some sort of slavish obligation. Sure. We're doing it because we love him, and he loved us first, and he died for us, and he's given us his righteousness. So, but that, that doesn't mean that we can just sit around and wait for the Spirit to move. Sometimes we need to move ourselves by practicing the disciplines, which include prayer, which include meditation, which include um, uh, Bible reading, which includes uh, accountability with other people, these kind of things. So uh, getting with a a larger group. So I think it's important to uh, actually live out the sanctifying life, but it's not under, it's not because of obligation, it's out of gratitude. Sure. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Turk. How you doing? Good. What's your name? My name's Adam. Adam, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here with Brother Jaden over there. He invited me out. All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming. He's one of the brothers in Christ. But um, I uh, appreciate your work and really glean from a lot of your uh, logical arguments on the existence of God. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a street evangelist myself, and oh, I actually preach in, uh, at Auburn campus from time to time as good. well. Um, we, we would differ theologically on some points, but... I mean, it's okay I'd, to be wrong. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'd, I'd, okay, I, I'd, I'd love to get your email and just exchange notes. But I had a question that keeps coming up in some of some of your uh, mm-hmm. discussions and, and, and forums is I, I notice you call uh, Christian sinners sometimes mm-hmm. and you say you're a hypocrite yourself. And um, I, I would ask uh, one, um, you, you're, you're married. How many years have you been married? I've been 17 myself. 38. Double G up. 38. <laughs> So w- your your wife's not an adulteress, right? She she loves you. She wouldn't cheat on you, huh? right? <laughs> She's out there. Okay. No, I, so, let me let me, let me well, just cut to the chase because yeah, we have yeah. questions behind you. Yeah. When I say sinner, I mean we're we're not we're not sinners theologically. Okay. We're saints theologically because of Christ is done. That's I right. get that, but yeah. I'm just pointing out that we all still sin. Well, Even though we're saved, uh, that's all. That's I, I, I would mean. ask. I would ask this question then: In the Bible, does it show anything definitely that s- Christians will continue to sin? Is there a definite, or is there an if, yes. a possibility? No, it, you will sin because that's what John says. John says, if you say you're not a sinner, you're a liar. No, actually, it's you're talking about First John one eight. Mm-hmm. It says, and if we say with that, with, we, we are without sin, we're and we it's, lie. it's sandwiched between two scriptures that say that we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. So John's actually speaking to the Gnostic there. The Gnostics believe that you could sin in the flesh and your okay. spirit's hang not on, touched. Hang on. I, we yeah. can't spend too much time. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's okay. okay. But, but what, what are, I'm are, are, yeah. are you suggesting that you can become perfect? Are well, you sinless, Je- perfectionist Jesus, person? Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Right. So and that's what, what, I, what I believe. Yeah. What's what's impossible for man is possible with God. It's see, and Scripture says if you sin, we have an advocate. There's a possibility to sin. Yeah. So I believe in the possibility to sin, but I also believe in what Paul came to at the end of Romans seven into Romans eight, that if you abide in the Spirit, God can, and we still need Jesus, not just for forgiveness, yeah. but for sanctification 
and for walking oh, in the I, spirit. I agree with all that. I'm just right. going to I'm just going to say up front that none yeah. of us do that perfectly. Well, and, and the point is, is that Paul doesn't do it perfectly. That's why Romans 7, he's saying, who's going to save me from this body of death? Okay, right? he, what I do want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I that's do. His, that's his testimony as a Pharisee, actually. No, that's before. his testimony after he's saved because he got saved no. in chapter 3. No, 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 no. If you, right, if you, uh, yeah. Let's we, talk later. We got to talk later on okay, that. All right, because, thank yeah, you. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, sir. What's your name? Hey, my name's Scott. Thanks for making me feel like a student again. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, and I really appreciate what I've heard tonight. And I'm sorry that all of a sudden you've become the expert on everything <laughs> in this question line. But my question was, in all this, I mean, brilliant argumentation and everything, do you ever run across the problem of somebody that, is just using their brain and trying to make a decision and become a Christian or not based just on the best argument. Why do you ask that, Scott? Because I, I sense that there are many people that, to use, you know, Bible quote, that are in the church and say they are Christians who have never been born again or born of the spirit or yeah let me maybe you know, I don't, you know, let I, me make a distinction here that might be helpful there's a difference between belief that and belief in mm -hmm. belief that is believing that Jesus rose from the dead that he's the savior but all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven mm -hmm. for that you got to go from belief that to belief in and we know this in relationships Right? You can know that somebody would be a good wife, but that person won't become your wife until you ask her. I mean, when I first met my wife 38 years ago, I got evidence that she'd be a good wife, but she didn't become my wife until I asked her. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. <laughs> so, see, the first, though, is just of the head. That's just apologetics. That's just evidence. But the second, there's no evidence involved. It's just trusting in what you already know is true. You've got to make a volitional decision, a choice. And James, who wrote James, says, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you know that if God exists and he does, and if demons exist and they do, that they know that God exists better than we do and that Jesus is the Savior better than we do? But they don't trust in him. Right. So we have to go from belief that to belief in. If we're just stuck on belief that, then we've never said I do to God. I guess that's why I or wanted to, Jesus. to ask this question mm -hmm. in a student intellectual atmosphere uh -huh. where people are searching for truth, yes. searching for this. Many times I've noticed on campus and things, it's all just who's got the best argument. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But remember, if faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe, that is yeah. true. I trusting in what you have good evidence to believe. One thing true. I've learned from this tonight is this is maybe the best starting place to get somebody to search their heart for sure. the truth. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it, Scott. God bless you. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Turek. I'm Nathan. Nathan, go ahead. Um, recently, I've been learning about the book of Job. Uh -huh. And um, in the beginning, God has a conversation with uh, Satan. Yes. And they have a basically a bet to right. like test Job mm -hmm. and see if he his faith is strong enough mm -hmm. and I was wondering like like why would God like really acknowledge uh, Satan's Satan's uh, bet right there just to like prove a point or something and like because he knows that Satan isn't really going to change at all so why would he even address that? Well, it's not just for Satan's benefit. It's not for Satan's benefit at all. It's for our benefit and Job's benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Job is thought to be the oldest book in the Bible, actually, probably written even before Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And um, it, the Bible's written from an observational perspective. Mm -hmm. So when it says that, you know, they had a bet or whatever, uh, do you think God didn't know the outcome of that bet? Well, yeah, he, he knew. Of course I mean, he, he knew. knows everything. Yeah, it's just like when know. Moses goes to convince God not to wipe out the Israelites after they worship the golden calf or 
you know, or it may have been after the numbers, it's the book of numbers a little bit later. And uh, it's like God gets new information and goes, okay, I won't kill him, right? Mm-hmm. That's written from an observational perspective. God always knew that Moses would come and pray. Mm-hmm. Um, so is the question regarding Job, is it, are, are, you, are you advancing some sort of moral problem with this? Or well, what's the... I'm also thinking about like just interactions between Satan and God uh-huh, uh-huh. and like also with like Jesus in the desert when he's, when he's asked questions by... Uh-huh. Yeah. by Satan, and yeah. like, just why does he give him time like that to... Well, it's for our benefit, mm-hmm. right? When we're, when we're supposed to go up against Satan, we're supposed to do exactly what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? Mm-hmm. He quoted scripture properly. Satan tried to take it out of context. Jesus quoted it properly, and mm-hmm. he prayed. And we're supposed to use those same weapons, prayer and the word of God, to fend off temptation. Mm-hmm. So, and if you notice what's going on today, it's been going on forever. People weaponize uh, our values against us. So they say, aren't you for love? Aren't you for equality? Aren't you for justice? Yeah, we're we're for all those things when they're defined properly. But -hmm. these are defined just a little bit off. Love now means either same-sex relationships or I'm going to try and transition my seven-year-old that's supposed to be love, according to them, when in fact that's not love at all. Mm-hmm. Or um, we're all for equality, but now people want equity. They're changing it to equity. We, we all believe in equality of, of opportunity, but equality of outcome? You're not even going to have equality of outcome in heaven. What does Jesus say to the, uh, uh, in the parable of the talents to the guy that hid his talent? I'm taken from you and given to the guy who actually did something with his talents. That's justice. That's not equity. Mm -hmm. So um, what people try and do is they try and take the values of the Bible, distort them slightly, and try and get us to swallow them. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what was going on with Jesus or with Satan and Jesus in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Take what God had said, distort it slightly, try and get Jesus to bite. And he didn't mm-hmm. because he was in tune with the word, in tune with God through prayer. And that's what we have to be as well. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Yes, sir. Second to last question. Here it is. Hey, What's um, your name? I'm Brandon. Brandon, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hey, first, let's go, Brandon. First, I want to say <laughs> uh, my grandma unknowingly got me a hat with that on it. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so first I want to say I really appreciate all the work you do uh-huh. and the amount of time and resources you devote to defending the faith. I think it shows that you have like the right thing and the right priority, and I really appreciate you. Well, and thanks. We like have a whole you. team doing this, though. I mean, it's not, it's not yeah. me. It's a whole team um, doing it. But go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so actually a previous question kind of sparked this uh-huh. uh, because I'm genuinely curious now. Uh, so, you know, we, I understand that in the Bible it says that we're all like born a slave to flesh and uh-huh. then we, we sin, we're, yeah. we're going to yeah. be imperfect, all that stuff, yeah. And then uh, once we're saved, I assume you're familiar with Romans 6, of course, like the first yeah. part of it, mm-hmm. uh, where it's like, shall we continue to sin mm-hmm. so that grace may abound? Certainly not. Right. Like, don't just sin because right. you're saved. Um, but it says that we have been put, like our flesh has been put to death, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and like that's what happens when we're when we're baptized. We have to crucify the flesh. Yeah, but it has to be continual. Yeah, yeah. And so, but the purpose of that is so that we're no longer a slave to the right. world, a slave to flesh, but right. that we're now a slave to Christ. Okay. Uh, but if we don't have a choice, and we still will sin. What do you mean inv- we don't have a choice? Well, if we invariably will sin. Even no, no, no. After I'm not saying saved. we're always going to sin. I'm saying there will be times when we will. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but yeah. like after the point of being saved, uh-huh. if we, if anyone at some point in the future invariably will sin, even after that point, then what's the purpose of putting to death the flesh if we're still seemingly a slave to it, if we can't seem to, over the course of our lives, well, choose you're, otherwise? You're gonna, what's the purpose of taking a shower if you're going to get dirty again? Right, but the... It's the but same it's like, thing. But it's like getting rid of all the dirt on the planet, and then you somehow got covered in mud. It's, that's kind of how I see okay, it. Okay, but the, the, the problem is, both theologically and practically, people that become Christians still sin. Okay? okay. Paul, I know I disagree with the gentleman before, 
in Romans 7, Paul's already been through salvation. And he wants to follow Jesus. And he says, what I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, I do. Okay? Uh, the old nature still exists. That's why we got to continue to crucify it. If it was gone, would we continue, need to continue to crucify it? No. no. So it's still there. Yeah. So every once in a while, it's going to get the best of us. And that's why we can confess our sins, and he is righteous and just, uh, but, righteous and just, and he will cl cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, the part that I don't understand is why we can't, why we have to fail at crucifying it at times. I'm not saying we have to. Sometimes we succeed, yeah. but sometimes we don't. So why couldn't we, it, could it potentially happen where we succeed at every single choice? It's, well, it's possible. Okay. Okay, that's, that's what was unclear to okay, me. So you it's, can, it's possible you that can. tomorrow I will crucify the flesh and the next day I will. Until you die. Yeah, but practically that ain't going to happen because my sin nature, I know my sin nature. Okay. And even thoughts come to my mind that are sinful. And okay, Jesus so said, if you even think about it, that was, that I'd was have to the gouge break. my eyes out. See, he talked about that, didn't yeah, he? That was the break that I was getting. It, okay. So you're not saying that I'm not it's saying, not I'm possible. Not, you're saying practically you were not going to see it. Yeah, well, okay. yeah practically we okay. are still going to sin, even though okay. we may succeed hopefully more than we don't. That makes sense. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Brandon. All right. Yes, sir. What's your name? How you doing? I'm Kevin. Kevin, go ahead, sir. Uh, found you on YouTube. Thank you again for what you do. Um, two quick questions. Uh -huh. um, one, I know we don't know the day or the hour that Jesus will return, uh -huh. um, but some say that we might know like the season. Uh -huh. And I heard about the rebuilding of the new temple uh -huh. with the Antichrist sitting in it. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know your thoughts on that. And is, does anything with Israel today have to do with all that going on? Just your thoughts I'm about that. I'm not on the planning committee. I'm on the welcoming committee. Got you. Okay. All right. I, I know people who are w much smarter than me who come to opposite conclusions on this stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. My friend Jack Hibbs is very passionate about this. And he, you know, one thing he's right about is we are getting closer. We all are, right? Uh, and, and Israel is in the land. That seems to be something the Bible talks about. But is this going to happen in the next few years or a thousand years from now? Nobody knows. Right. Nobody knows. Right. If Jesus as a man didn't know, no, prof, no so-called prophet or teacher or pastor knows now. What we're supposed to do is always be ready. Right. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus. Right, right. I'm, okay, so yeah. just be ready. In agreement. Yeah, occupy right, till he comes. Good. My other question is, what's your thoughts on the Apocrypha and the, the Book of Maccabees? Like, are we... Should we study these along with the Bible, or should we just study the Bible alone? I think you can study them because there's good historical information in there, but I don't think they're part of inspired scripture. Why? number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, Jesus and the apostles never quoted from the Apocrypha. Uh, they quoted from all the other areas of the Old Testament. Number two, the Jews didn't consider that inspired writings either. Uh, and why it's in they're in the catholic bible now is because in 1546 at the council of trent in response to luther the roman catholic church officially decided ecumenically that the apocrypha should be in the old testament now augustine thought it should have been but it was never a complete ecumenical cyclical or if you will or a, a declaration back then uh jerome didn't think it should be in the, in the Old Testament. In fact, he refused to translate it. He was one of the great translators in the early centuries of the church. So for me, if the Jews don't have it in their Old Testament, Jesus and the apostles never quote from it, why, why would we think it's inspired? Right. Okay. okay. Uh, but I think there's very good information in it. All the stuff about the Maccabees in there, that's good historical information uh, from, you know, the second century B.C. and Tychius Epiphanes and all that, where we get Hanukkah from and all that. I think all that... That's, that's good. It's good to study it, but I don't think it's inspired. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. These are the last two questions right here. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm a, uh, as they say, long-time listener, first-time first caller. Yes, sir. Um, I thought of something earlier, picking back off uh, another question. I appreciated the question that the woman asked about um, speaking in tongues and how that's to be interpreted uh -huh. modern day. Yeah. It made me just, I wanted to ask quickly what might be your encouragement to someone in who may be struggling with reconciling what they read in scripture uh -huh. and what their specific denomination uh, teaches and that's my question well it depends on whether the denomination whether the denomination makes tongues an essential issue because there are some that do there are some that say if you don't speak in tongues you're not saved 
which is ridiculous. So if you're in that denomination, adios amigos, okay? But if they just think that it's, you know, it, it happens, okay, you can, it's, you can agree to disagree. I personally, as I mentioned earlier, think that tongues in the Bible is always a known language. I don't think it's a private prayer language. Uh, so that's my position. I could be wrong on that. Uh, the, uh, the website I mentioned earlier, God Questions, has several articles on it. So if you want to go further, check that out. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, um, my name's Landry. Hey, Landry. Um, so why has um, a modern day th- Christianity gotten uh, so far away from uh, a teaching, um, a practicing the, the uh, Sabbath and then... Um, f- Fasting. Yeah, excellent question. For um, like my entire life of like being 18, it's like only been mentioned biblically, not in like large church settings. With regard to the Sabbath, there are 10 commandments as we all know. The only one not repeated in the New Testament is keep holy the Sabbath because the Sabbath has arrived in Jesus. We, we rest in Jesus. He does all the work, okay? So... The other Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament and are therefore then binding on Christians. (coughs) Excuse me. Mm. But keep holy the Sabbath is not one of them. This does not mean you shouldn't go to church or you had, you know, it's not a good idea to take a day off or, you know, make sure you go to church or any of that kind of thing. So the Sabbath no longer applies. Fasting is something that many of us Americans could get a lot of benefit out of. (laughs) Okay? So uh, we ought to probably do more of that And you're right, we tend not to do that. Uh, John Mark Comer has a new book. Well, it's a few years old now. He's the pastor out there in Portland. Yeah, there are a few Christians still in Portland. Um, He has a book. I'm trying to think of the name of it now. I just listened to it. But he talks a lot about fasting and how important fasting has been to him Mm -hmm. to help him with the disciplines, to help him even come out of depression, to help him concentrate on God. And so I think fasting is something we probably ought to do more of. Yeah, but in 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 the uh, sermon on the uh, mount, uh, Jesus says when you fast, mm-hmm. not if you mm-hmm. fast. Yeah. So I don't really think that's a like we could do it. I uh-huh. think that's a a fundamental part of our faith that has been ignored for a very long time. Also, a gluttony is not pre- uh, preached on and. America has seen the effects right. Of that. <laughs> I know, I know, and, and I understand why. Sometimes, if you preach on gluttony, everybody knows who's guilty of it. See, that's yeah. part of the, that's part yeah. of the problem. Yes, okay, uh, so that's part of the problem. But I think I think you're onto something with regard to fasting, because it's not just about keeping fit. It's it's about uh, it's about sacrificing something and causing you then to concentrate yeah. on God. Yeah. Because when you do fast, you'll, you're continually reminded that you are fasting. Why are you mm-hmm. fasting? Because of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think you're on to something. Thank you. Okay. Hey, folks. Yeah. Do you have any energy for three online questions? As long as they're quick, go ahead. Well, you can be quick. All right. And, uh, First answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. Go ahead. Um, First one is, if God chooses to allow the devil to continue to exist, knowing he is going to tempt us into sin, is God making the devil his agent? Well, God is in control of everything, ultimately. He could take the devil out. But when people say, why doesn't God take the devil out? I could ask, we could easily ask the same question to the person asking the question, why doesn't God take you out? Right? Because we do evil every day. In fact, years ago, I was at Michigan State, And I I knew there was a pretty militant atheist in the audience because he sat through the entire two-hour presentation like this. I mean, he didn't crack a smile once, and I had some pretty good jokes in there. (laughs) Anyway, when it was time for Q&A, his hand shot up. He was on this side of the room, and he said, if there is a good God, why doesn't he stop all the evil in the world? And I said, sir, that is an excellent question. Maybe because if he did, he might start with you and me because we do evil every day. You ever notice when we start complaining about evil, we always start complaining about somebody else, whether it's the devil or God, why don't you stop him or why don't you stop her? We never think, God, why don't you stop me? Question, if God were to stop all evil at midnight tonight, would you still be alive at 12.01? No, I wouldn't be. So it's the same question that we could ask about ourselves. God gives us the freedom to do good but also evil, and the ultimate thing is that God can redeem it all for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. God can redeem it. 
Number two, um, how could Moses write about his own death and beyond in Deuteronomy 34, 10 through 11? When we say Moses wrote the Pentateuch, we're not denying that there could have been other people that contributed. It could have been Joshua that wrote that. It could have been editors that came later. In fact, I think editors did come later, and they changed certain city names to the current city names, like Ramses, the city of Ramses. The cities of Ramses was a, didn't... Uh, completely exist in New Testament, I mean, in uh, Exodus times. It was avarice at the time. And, and so they changed the name so later readers would go, oh, they're talking about Ramses. It's like today, if I told you that we went to Gaul, most of you are going to go, what's he talking about? But if I said we went to France, you'd go, oh, okay. So I think that's probably what's going on in some of those uh, places in the Old Testament where editors did come in. And God can inspire the editing process too. Right? Last right. question. Um, you said once saved, always saved. Doesn't uh, Matthew seven twenty two through 23 imply that we need to know God before going to heaven? I'd have to read those passages, but that's true whether you're once saved, always saved or not. Sure, you got to know God. That's the whole point. That's the purpose of life, to know God and to make him known. Not just intellectually, not just believe that, but belief in, <laughs> trust in. So... I think that once you trust in and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said in John 5, he said, he who believes is passed from death into life. In other words, you get eternal life when you believe. You don't get it when you die. You get it when you believe. And if it's eternal, can you lose it? No. So I think it's once saved, always saved. Now, that we see people who said, oh, yeah, I was a Christian once. Well, maybe they were never completely saved. Maybe, as, you know, remember Jesus talks about the four soils? Only one of those four soils is good. You remember one of those soils where it sprouts up and then the, the, the weather chokes it out? or Yeah, it looked like they were a believer initially and then they're not anymore. So we should expect that. Hey, I want to mention out there, next Thursday night, Lord willing, we'll be at the University of Cincinnati and we'll be right here on the YouTube channel or the Facebook page or Instagram or wherever you're watching this, our YouTube, or I mean our cross uh website. So thanks for being here and thanks everybody here at War Eagle. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.